everyone. Welcome um, to the Western Slope Livestock and Forage Grower Update. If you have um, issues hearing us, please just type it in the chat. Um, and so this webinar is an educational webinar presentation brought to you by uh, CSU Extension on the Western Slope. And it's 10 a.m. So we'll go ahead and get started. Just a couple housekeeping things. Um, Colorado, or, uh, video conferencing etiquette for today. Internet connections can be good or bad. If you have a bad connection, remember that the presentation will be recorded for later viewing. The webinar platform used today disables your camera and audio. There are simply just too many people on today's uh, webinar for a live discussion, but please put your questions into the chat and we'll answer them as we go. You're in a class or maybe at home or another location, so please keep from being distracted. Um, that way we don't repeat ourselves or any questions and, and take up some valuable time. If you are from somewhere other than the Western Slope, welcome, but understand that most of our examples are for this area. If you have questions, please contact your local extension office. Uh, if you need um, closed caption um, for today's presentation, please email Retta Brugger at coloradostate.edu and she'll go ahead and pop her um, email in the chat. CSU is an equal access and equal opportunity university. For more information, please visit the website. And again, Retta, or, uh, Retta will pop that in the chat. If you, um, Colorado State University Office of Engagement and Extension ensures that no person is subjected to prohibited discrimination based on national origin in any program or service. It is our policy to ensure that reasonable steps are taken to provide timely, meaningful access and an equal opportunity to participate in services, activities, programs, and other benefits to individuals whose first language is not English. This policy includes providing oral interpretation or written translation of vital documents and other information limited English proficient persons without cost to program participants. And if anybody needs um, additional resources in Spanish, please email Retta. Um, and it, should we have any problems, if we have any technical issues or unexplained issues on this webinar, um, we'll disable this current webinar, but please check your email for a backup link um, and then log in that way and we'll continue on with our meeting. And with that, I will go ahead and introduce our first speaker. We've got Matt, Matt Thorpe. He's the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Southwest West Deputy Regional Manager and Wolf Reintroduction Management Team Member for CPW. Welcome, Matt. Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Give me just a second to share my screen. Make sure everybody can see the uh, wolf update screen. Um, yeah, thank you guys for the opportunity. My name is Matt Thorpe and uh, yeah, I'm with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife here out of our Durango Regional Office. And I have been part of the, uh, the wolf planning team. So um, Robin, Young, who's with CSU Extension, who was uh, on our technical working group, asked me to give just a very high level and quick update on uh, where we are with the draft wolf plan. So um, as I go through this again, you know, when we presented the whole plan to the commission, it took about four hours. I have about 15 minutes. So I'm really going to keep this very high level and I'm going to try to highlight some of the changes that I think will be uh, of most interest for folks that are on this call. Um, so, as everyone recalls, back in 2020, there was uh, Proposition 114 that uh, passed by a slim margin, but it directs, it's now in state law, it says that the commission will restore wolves west of the Continental Divide, that we'll have to develop a methodology and a plan. Uh, one of the things that CPW is charged with is resolving conflicts with those involved in farming and ranching, and that we also need to have all the steps in place so that we can reintroduce wolves by December, by the end of this year. Um, so over the past two years, we've really done um, a lot of work trying to develop this plan. We created a technical working group, which uh, consisted of biologists who've been involved with wolf management across the West, also included folks like Robin uh, from CSU, 
uh, had a few county commissioners. So their charge was really to look at sort of the technical aspects of wolf reintroduction and wolf management and make recommendations. We also convened a stakeholder advisory group and that group uh, consisted of basically a cross section of, of residents of Colorado. So there were wolf advocates, there were ranchers, uh, hunters, county commissioners. So really a broad group that uh, considered some of the more social aspects of the wolf reintroduction. And so we've taken all of their work and we use that to develop a wolf plan that was a draft. Uh, it's about, the plan is 90 pages with all the appendices. I think it's about 300 pages. This plan was presented first to our Parks and Wildlife Commission back in December. Uh, and then since that time, we've hosted five meetings across the state to try to take more input. So that was an opportunity for the public, either through written comments or to go testify in person at a commission meeting. Uh, those just wrapped up. And so at this past meeting last week in Denver on February 22nd, that's the point where the commission actually gave staff direction on what revisions they wanted to see within the plan. Um, you know, when we put it out of staff, it was our best effort, but we knew that there were gonna be some things that, that people would wanna see changed. And so I'm gonna just highlight some of the things that remain the same, but also some of the things that changed. Um, so where we're at currently is that staff now has direction on what changes need to be made. And so we're, we're working on those changes. We're also working on some of the rules that will be promulgated uh, because of the plan or regulations. And so we're also working on those. Those will go back to our Parks and Wildlife Commission in April, and then hopefully they will be the final adoption. It's a two-step process. So the, the final wolf plan and the regulations should be adopted in May of 2023. And that's gonna allow us to meet our statutory deadline. Once we have those elements of the plan in place, then we can start moving forward, uh, making some of the other details and plans to get ready for the reintroduction. Uh, so one of the things that, again, just high level overview, so animal capture, what was proposed in the plan is that we would reintroduce anywhere from 30 to 50 wolves total. We would do this over a three to five year time frame. Um, our donor populations will most likely be from some of the northern Rocky states. Um, and we're looking at bringing in 10 to 15 animals per year. So that did not change. That's something that uh, we think biologically we can, can develop our own self-sustaining population in Colorado with bringing in those limited numbers. There's not a need to bring in more. So again, that didn't change or hasn't changed. Uh, second piece deals with sort of the reintroduction logistics. So again, this did not change. So what we're envisioning is a hard release, which is uh, we bring the wolves into Colorado and we immediately release them. This is something that would happen in the winter months. Uh, biologically, this makes sense. It's you know because of the colder weather, it's less stress on the animals, but they're also any wolves that we catch uh, are old enough, mature enough that they'll be able to get by on their own. And then all of the wolves that we bring in will be fitted with GPS collars. So that again, there were no changes based on the draft plan. So the proposition said that we need to, we're required to release them west of the continental divide. And so as you look at this map, so the dotted line represents the continental divide, excuse me, the continental divide. Um, we basically zeroed in on two areas for the reintroduction. So one would be basically the I-70 corridor and then the second one would be the Highway 50 corridor from Monarch Pass out to Montrose. Our plan is that initially the, the first year that we would release animals on that I-70 corridor and then reevaluate. And then we do have that second area as another potential release site. So there were no changes from the commission on that. So that uh, will be maintained in the plan. Something that I think is really uh, a, a lot of interest and very important for folks that are on this call is the concept of lethal management. And so we're talking about lethal management. We mean trying to re uh, remove targeted removal of animals that are causing issues primarily with livestock owners. Uh, we know from looking at all the other states, the Western states, that this is a contentious issue. Uh, there's strong feelings on both sides. But I think something that's really important to remember is that 
this kind of lethal removal is going to be targeted and it's generally done at pretty small scales where as much as possible we're looking at individual animals. Uh, we're confident that this kind of lethal management really doesn't present any threat to the long-term viability of the wolf populations. We know that wolves are generalists, they're highly successful in raising uh, their pups and you know we expect that that population is going to grow very quickly and so it's not going to be a threat. And importantly, our technical working group, again, that consists of a lot of scientists uh, who've been involved in wolf management over the last 25 to 30 years, highlighted that this was really an important aspect of having a successful wolf reintroduction program. So now we'll move on to our draft conflict minimization and compensation program. So again, the proposition wording, which is now in state law, says that CPW is required to assist owners of livestock in preventing and resolving conflicts between gray wolves and livestock. So the way we're proposing to do that is that CPW will be providing temporary conflict minimization materials. So if you can see my cursor, so Fladry is here on the left. That's, uh, and it can also be Turbo Fladry, which is an electrified poly wire that has flags on it. So this is something used to deter wolves from crossing that line. Uh, so this is something that we've already been using up in North Park. Uh, we've also, things that CPW will be able to provide are fox lights. So these are basically strobe lights that go off at random intervals. Again, we're just trying to deter wolves by giving kind of a, a novel stimulus that scares them away. We also use, folks may be familiar with propane cannons, cracker shells. I'd also point out that CPW has already developed a wolf resource guide for livestock owners. This is a document that uh, we've, we've partnered with Montana who first produced this. Uh, it just gives an overview of the different strategies that livestock owners can use to try to minimize conflicts with wolves. Uh, in addition, CPW has also hired a wolf conflict coordinator. This is a statewide position uh, that is gonna be working with landowners to make sure that uh, they're aware of the steps that they can take to try to reduce and minimize conflict. I will point out, we don't call it conflict prevention, just because we know at some point there will be conflicts. So that's why we're calling it conflict minimization. Second part of the, the statute says that CPW is required to pay fair compensation to owners of livestock for any losses caused by gray wolves. This was something that our stakeholder advisory group really spent quite a bit of time discussing. And they came up with some kind of some basic principles along with staff. And some of these basic principles are that conflict minimization techniques are not a requirement for compensation, but they are going to be encouraged and incentivized. Especially as staff, we felt strongly that, um, you know, eventually wolves are gonna be distributed across the landscape. We're not gonna have a collar on every wolf. So it's likely that a wolf could show up. We know also that they can cover large amounts of territory in a pretty short time. So we didn't want any landowner who had no idea that wolves were even in the area to be penalized. So that's why that's one of our principles. Uh, also our depredation confirmations similar or very similar to what we do currently for big game like bear and lions. It's gonna be based on a preponderance of the evidence standard. That sounds like it's a big barrier, but really it just means it's more likely than not that wolves cause the damage. Um, again, similar to our, our big game damage statutes, uh, compensation would be reduced. If somebody had insurance on the animal, it would be reduced by the amount they got through the insurance. Uh, something that's different with wolf damage versus our big game damage is that it actually is more broad. It allows us to pay for direct compensation, so that's a direct loss or injury of an animal, but also indirect losses. And we'll talk about that a little more here in just a second. So uh, there's kind of different levels is the way it's been drafted. And there's been some changes from the draft plan and I'll highlight those as we go through them. So what we're terming as base compensation essentially is very similar to what livestock owners may have experienced already with bears or lions. And so for the confirmed death of livestock, and that's actually was specifically defined in the proposition as cattle, horses, mules, burros, sheep, lambs, swine, llama, and goats. 
Uh, we did add though for guard and herding animals. Uh, so those animals, if they're killed by a wolf and it's confirmed, they'd be reimbursed at 100% of the fair market value. Uh, the draft plan proposed an $8,000 per animal cap. The Parks and Wildlife Commission received a lot of testimony from producers saying that wasn't enough. And so they actually have directed us to increase that to the max is $15,000 per animal. Uh, another piece is veterinarian costs for injured livestock or guard herding animals. Uh, those are also reimbursable up to the fair market value of the animal, but it can't exceed $15,000. And then there's one of the new things versus the base compensation is that after a confirmed depredation to sheep or cattle, livestock owners have additional options. The one is a basic compensation ratio. So this would be applicable for uh, calves, yearling cattle, or sheep. And this is designed to address the fact that these animals could be predated by wolves, but could be difficult to find because of their relatively small size in large open range settings. So this is a more simplified process. Or there's an option for uh, cattle and sheep owners to, to, produce, or to can go after itemized production losses. And this would be a way to address missing calves, yearlings, or sheep, but also decreased weight gains like decreased weaning weights, decreased conception rates and other things could be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, this would require additional and specific baseline documentation. An important note in the, a change that the commission gave us as it was originally drafted specifically for conception rates as an example, it was gonna require that you needed to have a veterinary statement signing off on what your current conception rates were versus that baseline. Uh, the commission felt strongly that ranch records, just because not everybody uses a vet for all those services, so that's something that's allowed. So again, very high level, but those are some of the, the, main, uh, the main points that I thought this group would be interested in. Um, I'll take any questions, but also just point out, if you wanna see the draft plan or all the documents, you can go to the CPW website. And uh, the commission isn't taking comments specifically about the plan, but there is still a comment form. And those will still get funneled to our commissioners and that's this engagedcpw.org. Perfect, thank you, Matt. Uh, we've got uh, one question here. What will the response time be on officers, especially in the snow and immediate responses needed for the evidence to be available? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that the commission has been talking quite a bit about, and it's been brought up quite a few times. Um, you know, our, our priority for our officers is to get there as soon as they can. Um, so we're actually trying to increase our staffing to help address this. Uh, the other thing that we're talking and trying to make sure that landowners know, and I think most producers that have had bear and lion issues know this, but if there's any way they can help preserve the scene, so if they can cover the animal with a tarp, if they can take their own pictures, that's gonna help us as well, just to try to make that, uh, that determination. So we're definitely trying to, to increase our capacity to respond in a timely manner. Perfect, thank you. All right, well, I don't see any other questions at this time, so we'll keep moving. Up next, we've got Eric McPhail. He's the Western Region Extension Director. He currently serves as the Western Region Director for Colorado State University Extension. He came to Extension with a bachelor's in animal science and a master's in ruminant nutrition. In his current role, he oversees around 65 staff members and the success of Extension programs serving 16 counties across Western, the Western Slope. Prior to his regional role, he served as the County Director for a youth and Ag Agent in Gunnison County for 16 years. Um, we'll go ahead and have you take it away, Eric. Thank you. Okay, Megan, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides or somebody can? Looks good. Okay, well, great. Welcome, everybody. And I really want to thank the team that put this together of extension specialists here on the Western Slope. And, and uh, looks like we have a large group and I really appreciate the opportunity to visit with you guys. This is going to be just a very high level kind of introduction to virtual fencing. I know with this many people, some of you have been really engaged with virtual fencing. And then some maybe not so much. And really, this is your first time being introduced to it. 
Um, I thank you for the nice introduction, Megan. Um, a little bit about my uh, background is I have a ranching background uh, from Texas. Um, spent eight years kind of privately in the private business managing a large ranch. And then um, currently, yeah, for the last six months, I've been the regional director on the Western Slope. But for more of this discussion, it's um, uh, really the last 16 years I've been the Gunnison County uh, Ag Agent and had the introduction about five years ago to start working with virtual fencing. And uh, so I've been really engaged with that here in the Gunnison Valley anyway. So I want to give you a little bit of a presentation about some of the introductions to virtual fencing and then actually kind of and what it is. And then I want to go ahead and just really tell you um, some of the applied applicable uses or non-uses for it. But with that, uh, yeah, communicating with livestock, it's easy, right? This technology is some of the most advanced stuff that's come out for the cattle industry in a long time. I'll primarily today talk about the cattle industry since that's what I've been involved with. But other small livestock, other a lot of companies are actually bridging into virtual fencing for them. So real quick, how did we get there? Um, yeah, well, forever, uh, cattlemen have been using ear tags uh, with the with the idea that it's about individual animal identification. And um, so the ear tags and the radio frequency tags allows for a lot of trace back on animal performance. And cattlemen have been capitalizing on that, uh, making uh, coming up with better and better breeding operations. And, uh, you know, much like uh, the ability for me as a parent to see my kid on the on the football field, um, you know, I need a number on him sometimes to see him. And um, that's kind of individual and traceability and record keeping um, has has really come a long way. And I just want to say that we've been using that for a long time. Um, but as we get into new technology today, this technology is really ramping up. And, um, and so I want us to think about it in kind of a couple different ways. At this point, we have ear tags that allow uh, actual animals to talk to us. So we can uh, find their locations, we can monitor them, all this coming over internet service and uh, cell service. Uh, at this time, there's probably 10 to 20 different companies that are making um, the individual tags that are starting to have an incredible amount of data uh, that comes through with them. So we can actually monitor a lot of health performance. Is the cow, are the cows moving? Or are they not moving? Uh, we can take their temperatures. We can kind of uh, take this data, put it into algorithms and computer programs. And next thing we know, we have, we know if a cow's calving or in heat or anything like that, which is really applicable uh, as we go forward. But again, these, this technology is changing daily, and I encourage everybody to go online and kind of Google and search for the different uh, ear tags that are out there. Some have solar panels on the actual ear tags, uh, providing energy to the tags. Uh, with this technology, usually um, it's sort of short range uh, in that you need some sort of transfer device to capture the data. Uh, if you see up here in this uh, top photo, you have um, sort of a device that captures the radio frequencies in these tags that allows for transfer over the cell signals and, and back to your cell phone. Uh, these devices can be out in the field, but usually that it's pretty short range uh, uh, distances with this technology in that uh, you can have these devices in your saddlebags. You can have these devices on drones, like you see in this picture, and it gives you a snapshot primarily of location of your animals and um, reading information off of those tags. Uh, but this is kind of the introductory technology, uh, and we've taken it even one step further. One thing I do want to let you know about is you're going to start hearing some terms like geofencing versus virtual fencing. And really and truly, the geofencing is more of a location uh, type of the technology in that once we have the location of the animal, um, then you can start doing a lot with it with computer programs and, and web applications. And you can actually set up fences that you get a, 
a notification on your uh, Apple Watch or computer that tells you if the cow is inside the fence or outside the fence. Uh, we can create boundaries, but we're not at this point with geofencing, we're not really talking to the cows. It's just that the cows are talking to us. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is you see this ear tag up on the right side. Uh, that, that's kind of really advanced technology. They're expensive tags. Uh, but these are bouncing directly off of satellites. And that's why there's a solar panel on this ear tag uh, so that you can capture that animal's location. And even with this technology, you'd be able to pull up uh, an, a web application and see if your animal is uh, left the country, maybe it's in Florida, maybe it's in Texas, but um, that technology doesn't isn't dependent on cell service or uh, internet service or anything like that. They're expensive tags, but there again, if a rancher buys a $15,000 bull, turns it out on the Forest Service, you may want to keep track of where that animal is. Uh, so with that, that's even some of the ear tag technology that's coming out at this time. Uh, but the virtual fencing, uh, is actually us being able to talk to the cow uh, where we can give the cow a stimulus and tell her something to do. Uh, so with that, I want to give you in a nutshell, just to get your mind around kind of virtual fencing, I have a, a, a little short video here. Uh, in this video, this is a rancher in Gunnison that we were uh, piloting a, a virtual fencing technology project where we were using the eShepherd system. And this was kind of the first day that these cows were introduced to virtual fencing. And if you can see my cursor, this is actually where kind of the virtual fencing is. Um, and I'll play this. So you can see the cows come up, they're probably getting an audio tone first, and then they get a pulse. And that cow turned around really nicely. You know, she may want to check it again. She's probably getting a pulse saying, what is this? And then um, at the end of this video, you can see she just walks on off and turns around. The whole idea is there's no fence out here. And, um, and those cows are actually being able to um, um, turn around from that. So with that, this is what it looks like on the cell phone or the computer application uh, website that you go to and have login information and so forth. The virtual fencing and us being able to talk to cows actually includes a lot of different things. I mean, it's bouncing off satellites, cell towers, you know, using applications like Google Earth. Um, again, some of the technology even bridges into getting notifications uh, to your uh, watches, some of the uh, smart watches. Um, here in this slide, I'll show you that we were collaring the cows up by the uh, headquarters. Uh, this cow spent a lot of time as we were collaring the cows, but then this is a one day snapshot of the traveling of that cow. So we can actually track the cow, know the location, know the direction she traveled that day. Uh, we turned them out into the pasture. You can see we know where she traveled. She goes up to the virtual fence, which is this line. And this was like in that video where the animal approaches the virtual fence, gets an audio tone, gets a shock. And, uh, and this worked real nicely. She turned around, she came back up, she checked it again, and then turned back around. But you can see all these green dots are actual cows. And uh, this technology actually is like putting a cell phone on top of a cow in that it has location, direction, has a gyro uh, technology into it, much like your cell phone in that uh, you can tell if the cow's head's down, if they're grazing, uh, if they're not moving, if they are moving. And again, a lot of this technology, once we capture that data, can actually be transferred back to uh, your cell phones. So with that, now the applied piece of the presentation, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we've done in Gunnison County and how the extension offices have been involved in it. The first one, again, um, th there's several companies I want to preface that that are developing this virtual fencing technology. Um, I think currently in the United States, we have four that are actively pursuing it, um, soon to have five. And um, so you, there are different companies using this, this technology. And, uh, and uh, primarily 
The eShepherd platform is an Australian-based platform. Here in Gunnison, we did this. Uh, oh, we spent about four years getting the technology as a as a, a pilot uh, program. We worked collaboratively with grants, and uh, we had a rancher here in the valley. We had CPW, we had the conservation district all involved. And um, so it was kind of a multi-agency uh, collaboration. With the eShepherd, uh, again, it's a Australian-based company that um, through COVID, uh, we weren't able to have anybody over here telling us how to even set the, the, the technology up. So we were building a base station, which is this device uh, from a uh, user manual, and uh, but we were able to get it done and, um, and uh, had a lot of success with this. Um, you can see with the eShepherd, a couple of things I wanna point out, they do have collars on them that have uh, solar panels, which provide energy to the collar. Um, this collar is a GPS type collar. And so this animal's location is actually monitored all the time just with the satellite. Um, so the collar always knows where the collar is at. Now, you may not know that until you have a base station. And a base station uh, is primarily a, a reporting device and an upload and download device where you can program these collars. You can turn them on, you can turn them off, you can set the fences and all those things. But once you set the collar with data, it can go out even outside the base station's range, which typically is eight to 10 miles. And even if they're not in range of the tower, the collars are still programmed. But again, until that animal comes back within range of this base station, then um, you don't have any data on the animal and can't do anything to change the collars. Um, but the base stations are primarily have solar panels, they have batteries inside, they have cell uh, technology to capture uh, cellular data and transfer back and forth so that it can actually uh, come back to uh, you at your computer, on your Wi-Fi, in your house, in your Lazy Boy chair. Um, with that also, um, here's a set of, here's looking at the, the collars and boxes. The collars have little electrodes or shocking devices on them. In this situation, the collars have weights to keep the uh, collars upright. So with that, uh, that project ended a, a couple of years ago, uh, primarily because the coming through COVID, uh, the company really wanted to start basing most of its stuff out of Australia, uh, hard to get parts and all those different things. So we dropped the pilot project, or actually it came to an end. We captured a lot of data um, and, um, and that concluded. Since in the last year, um, the project I've been working on is with Vince. And Vince is kind of the US-based company that has a ton of uh, applicable uses. Currently, uh, they're probably the most commercialized business right now. They actually got bought out by Merck Animal Health, uh, bringing a lot, which will bring hopefully in the next couple of years, a lot of resources to this technology and updating of the technology. But with that, Gunnison County here with me decided to, in the extension office, decided to actually buy a base station from Vince and then actually have collars on hand so that we could really start to implement the technology locally on hand give, uh, with a lot of educational uh, vetting out of the technology so that we would be better prepared for ranchers to be able to take up the technology as soon as they can. Uh, this system is something that you do have with this company. You do have to buy like a base station. Uh, sometimes you may need one, two, three, four, uh, five base stations to cover a, an area. But again, they reach for about eight to 10 miles. But these base stations do have to be within cell signal uh, so that they can transfer and you can receive and, and uh, transmit data. Uh, with this technology, it's a little bit different than the Shepherd. Uh, these collars are more battery powered and the batteries last about six to 10 months. And um, so with that, once the batteries are installed and the collars are put together, it takes about two minutes 
to four minutes to put these collars on. So that's a big challenge too. If you're doing 200 head, it could be a 10 hour day for you to just put the collars on. Um, but they actually provide pulses through this chain technology around their neck. And um, I've been told that um, by 2025, uh, Merck is going to come out with uh, brand new collars. Uh, these are constantly being updated and the technology is being updated, but there's a little process to it. One of the fun things is we actually put the collar on a yak. Uh, so this is what we, who the, we call this animal the yakster and uh, she's got a nice fun collar around her neck. Uh, but again, back to why extension is sort of involved and why I got involved here is that I believe there's a huge educational component to this technology. Um, if you see in this graph, this is sort of what it looks like on the web interface uh, with the vent system where we can have a red virtual fence. Something to highlight there too is that the fence, uh, you know, the GPS location is not really, really precise. So there is some variability in the distance of the fence. And that can be as up to the width of a football field even. And so that sort of goes into your training thoughts around where you put your fences and so forth. Uh, in this situation, if you look at this picture up here, uh, we have a actual fence, this green line right here. And when we were training these cows, uh, we, we had a virtual fence along this line as well, uh, so that we were trying to contain all the cows in here. They had a actual fence and a virtual fence to do the training, thinking that we would do that for a couple of days. Well, that first night we turned them out, we turned the vent, the, the, the fence on and this fence wasn't a great fence. It was kind of just a couple of strands of wire and the whole herd of cows ended up because of a rainstorm and a lightning storm. Uh, they bunched up along the side of this hill. And as the cows were coming down to the fence, because in a rainstorm, they wanted to get over to the cottonwood trees. Um, we had a big issue because they all went through their normal fence and the virtual fence and were getting shocked and pulsed. And, uh, but luckily uh, we were able to uh, cut the system off at that point pretty easily. Uh, to make sure the cows were, were not getting untrained or learning bad behaviors or those type things. But we did learn if you have a slope and a fence at the bottom of a slope, you know, cows have a hard time wanting to turn around uh, and go back up a hill uh, versus going on down through the hill. So um, there's a lot there with the technology. Um, I guess at this point, I'll go ahead and uh, end with saying there's a lot to this technology and there's a lot still to vet out between companies and ranchers and their actual usabilities. I think I want uh, the primary message to be that this needs to be with the companies and the ranchers and them figuring out their limitations and uses of the technology over the next five years um, before people uh, start coming in and actually telling ranchers how to use the, uh, the system. Uh, so mainly because as we have wildlife and conservation interest type groups and federal agencies wanting to tell ranchers to exclude animals out of different areas or keep them off bike tracks or, or keep them out of riparian areas or so forth, we want to be very, very thoughtful because at the end of the day, this is the rancher putting the technology on his cows and um, he has to be aware of all the animal health implications, animal uh, welfare applications, and those type of things. So I think the technology is coming. It's revolutionary, but I still think we need about five years for people to keep piloting this project. And I will say that that vent system is currently probably on a hundred different operations right now. Uh, and I don't know how many cows uh, they've had collared, but uh, being widely used. So I'll stop at that point and um, go ahead and uh, uh, I guess open it up to questions. Eric, you've got a few in the chat box there. Oh, sorry, Megan, I didn't realize that you were there. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Robin. You're good. Okay. So, um, what is the price range for these systems? Okay, so I can't speak to any of the other companies, but the Vents one at this time. But the uh, the base station for the Vents Corporation is running like twelve thousand to. 
$13,000 for just that solar panel base station. And then they actually, because the collars are updating uh, monthly and new technologies are bettering and bettering, it ends up being that um, those collars are on a lease program. So a rancher may lease 200 collars and uh, get all the technical support with that. And those, the lease on those is about $35, I think. But then again, the battery uh, cost to those collars is like $10 or something like that, so. And define short range. So short range with the, uh, with the ear tag technology where it's actual radio frequency tags, um, that short range technology is more like 50 to 100 yards. So if you think about a football field, uh, if your cows are within that football field, you need a trans or a receiver within that area. Uh, so maybe that's the specifics with that. On the virtual fencing technology, as long as that base station is within cell service, then again, yeah, that long range technology is like eight miles, eight to 10 miles, depending on the terrain and those type things. Does it store data in range? Yes. Okay. And when you say these tags are expensive, um, okay, I think you've covered that one. Elizabeth, I hope that answers your question. Um, is, is there any type of insurance policy on them if one gets ripped out? So with the tag technology, I do not know. We haven't implemented the, just the actual GPSing tagging location and kind of that geofencing technology. Um, I don't know how those companies set up. But with the uh, with the vent system that the ranchers are working with, um, yes, the collar goes down, they get lost. This happens. The collar breaks. You know, an animal rubs the collar. You can think about a bull rubbing up his neck against a T post. It's going to break. They all have breaking strengths and stuff for for uh, uh, animal welfare, and uh, those are anywhere from 400 pounds of strength to 600 pounds of strength. And so, if you lose these collars out in the pasture, which happens. Um, or they go down, then yes, the company uh, quickly sends you another uh, collar. Um, what is the virtual fence effectiveness on calves? Um, it's very effective on calves. I mean, they were doing a lot with yearlings and those type things, but actual, but not many folks are actually putting them on young calves. They're more just uh, putting them on, on the uh, cows at the time. And so, um, but with that, yes, calves can go outside the fence, you know, where the cow may be stopped. And, but yet that calf, if it gets in trouble, usually the cow blows right on through the fence and goes over to her calf. And then at that point, the color cuts off until she comes back within the herd. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the calves do respond. They're actually uh, pretty smart to it as well. But yearling cattle, you know, they may not end heifers. They, Sometimes it is a little more challenging with those guys than the older cows. So, and I think you've kind of answered this one. Um, how effective is the technology keeping groups of cattle separated? If they are super determined to join the other group, is the shock powerful enough to keep to stop them? No, it not really. Um, to that aspect, you know, when we have collars that aren't working, maybe four or five percent of the collars uh, get butter in the battery compartments or something like that you can think about that as a as a situation where where you actually have 10 cows outside the main group and it is a draw for those other cows to go through the fence and um so you know that's an animal welfare thing and to be cognizant of how that's happening because you don't want bad behavior continually being trained with the cows and so so right now i'd say it's not real effective if you just wanted to pull 10 cows out of the herd and bring them back to the uh, headquarters. Uh, you could try it, but um, to, with some limited success at this time. Okay, and Eric, there's a few more questions in the chat, but we are running a little yeah. bit over time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Megan. And what I'll do is answer those questions as I can in the chat. I'll just continue that chat going, thanks. Thank you, Eric. And Robin. Okay, so up next, we've got Ryan Rhodes. He's going to talk about our total ranch analysis for Colorado. Dr. Rhodes is an associate professor and beef extension specialist at Colorado State University. In his current position, Ryan is responsible for developing, prioritizing, and implementing innovative statewide beef extension programs 
based on the Colorado beef industry needs. He has also worked closely with several state and national beef industry organizations to assist with strategic planning and the development of producer training tools. Ryan, his wife, and three children live in Wellington, where they own and operate a small direct-to-consumer beef business called Elevation Beef. Hey, thank you. Can you see that? Good. All right. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, so I got a lot to a lot to cover here in this what we're calling a track update. Tons of metrics to go through. So I'm going to go um, kind of fast, hopefully, um, and then I'm happy to follow up with people individually if you've got questions about what you see. Um, so yeah, pretty much covered my introduction. I've been here six years. Um, uh, the key to that is when I first got here, there, there were no um, updated, I'm going to say updated um, Colorado cow-calf business benchmarks. And so I was using Texas numbers and you know pretty much lying to people around the state because those numbers aren't the same here. Um, and so we formed a, a program called TRAC, Total Ranch Analysis for, for Colorado, which I'll get into here in just a minute. Um, but before I do, I wanna, I wanna point out a couple of things on, on this slide is in that word business um, is, is important as we think about this discussion, um, because I, I truly believe and as traveling around working with folks around the state that we have to treat these, these operations as a business, which means a lot of things, but, but in particular means we, you know, we need to include all costs, um, which you know, includes salaries, depreciation, things you oftentimes don't see included in benchmark numbers. Um, and we also need to think about evaluating um, enterprises as well. So not just the cow-calf enterprise, but you know, what's your hay business doing? What's your, what's your replacement heifer um, numbers look like and, and so forth. And we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, but for today, the focus is, again, we gotta go quick. Um, the focus is, is to, just to give you a little better sense of, of the track program, if you're not familiar with it. And, to, to give you the results of the benchmarks we've collected over the last uh, three years. Hopefully this works. Okay, why are you not advancing? Um. Sorry, I'm not sure. Is anybody able to move? Oh, there we go. Maybe it just takes a second. I think it's the second slide for some reason has, is slow, sorry. There we go. Okay, so, Again, I won't spend much time here, but when I first got here, we, we did a comprehensive a needs assessment with, with a couple thousand producers around the state asking them, you know, what, what are your priorities? And a couple of things came out of that, um, which led to the formation of the track program. Um, first, it was clear that the financial situation on ranches was the number one barrier to success. Um, and so we, you know, we felt like the, the message was that folks really need help with business management their financial situation, meaning costs and cash flows and things like that. So that was clear, a clear message. Um, we asked a question about um, data collection and what, what data do you routinely collect? And every, everything from, you can see on the screen at the bottom left corner there, everything from percent calf crop down to body condition score. And you can see from the results, 40 to 80% of folks said, we yeah, we routinely collect this information. Everybody's got their little red book. Everybody writes it down. Um, the follow-up question to that was, okay, do you know your break even within 10 cents a pound? And the results of that were 35% said, yes, we know our break even within 10 cents a pound. Now, having done this for three years and working with folks around the state, I would say, honestly, that number is closer to 5% of people know their break even. Um, but, but the message here is people, producers are writing stuff down, they're tracking the information, but they are not turning that information into wisdom 
that they can use to make decisions. If that makes sense. And so this was a clear message to us that, hey, we can help with this. Um, this is a spot we can help with. Um, it was also encouraging to see that the primary motivation for folks around the state is, is one, productivity. And yeah, we want to be profitable and, and, and grow our enterprise, which is important when we're, we're talking about, you know, digging into numbers and making better decisions. All right, so a little bit about the track program. Um, to date, so we started this in, in 2019, um, and it was funded by a large USDA grant. Um, to date, we have enrolled 30 individual new ranches into the program, and I'll give you a little bit more about that here in just a second. Um, we have completed, so the data you're going to see following this is from 65 individual ranch um, analysis, if you will. Um, and then we've got 21 more scheduled already for 2023. My capacity, because it is such, such an intense analysis, um, is about 25 ranches. And so if you, at the end of this, if, you, if you're interested, you better get a hold of me fairly quickly because slots are, are, are almost filled up. Um, our approach is we, we sit down with you. Um, we provide the ranch with the most accurate, I believe, enterprise analysis possible. We sit down with you, we, we collect and verify your data, we bring it back, we run it through our process here, um, and total time from start to finish with travel and, and analysis and whatnot is about 40 hours per ranch, and so it's not an easy task. Um, but we, again, we're, I'm going back to we want the most accurate set of numbers possible, and, and that's what it takes to get it. Um, we try to, we've tried to put together a set of very holistic, um, what I'm going to call key performance indicators that can easily be tracked over time. You can see a few of those on, on the right-hand side there. Um, and our goals are pretty simple through this program is, is one, we, we're providing training and assistance with record keeping data management, which folks said they need help with. Um, we, I really believe we've increased producers knowledge and tools and strategy to help manage the ranch. And at the end of the day, the most important thing in, in our world is that we improve your competitiveness and profitability um, through this, this exercise of internal external benchmarking of, of key performance indicators. And so that's just a, a little bit about the program. Um, let's talk about just for a second, benchmarking. Um, and so again, that, that's what this program is all about is developing benchmarks and, and internal and external benchmarking on individual ranches. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great tool to compare financial production performance across similar ranches. Um, and we all know we don't have much time. Um, we're, we're all busy. And so, man, if you had something that could, that could help you identify places on your operation to be more efficient and to focus on, we feel like that's a, that's a big win. Um, there are some considerations when we think about looking at benchmark numbers. Um, obviously, I, we leave it up to the ranch manager to make the final decision about what our strengths and weaknesses as you're, as you're comparing to other ranches. Um, there are unique circumstances that generate differences. Gosh, in this state, there's huge differences from Eastern Plains to Western Slope in terms of how those numbers are, are generated. And so you gotta be careful there when you're comparing uh, numbers. Um, and, and then obviously utilize the systems approach when making changes. We don't wanna push on one thing necessarily. Um, we, we need to take a systems approach when we're thinking about implementing changes. Um, in terms of, we call them key performance indicators and that's how we report metrics back. We've got on the, on the right-hand side, you can see just an example report of what we give back to somebody. That includes, oh gosh, I think there's 15 KPIs on there. We track 30 plus KPIs, so this is just a snapshot. But you can see the individual ranches numbers there um, compared to what the benchmark for the state numbers are. And then we also work with the, the producer to develop a target for the next year. Um, and, and obviously that's where you can see places to, to improve. But I like to tell people these are, I mean, this, these KPIs are EPDs for your business, right? These are the most critical factors um, to success in your operation. And so tracking them over time is, is something that, that, that can be really, really beneficial. Um, also, just a caution too, as we're thinking about benchmark numbers, understand, very, very important to understand how that number is calculated before you start to use it uh, or compare it to, to something you might have. Because um, there is a lot of differences in the way those numbers are calculated. Uh, we, we track, we bucket things into four categories. And this is what we'll work through here in the remaining time. Is We have a set of production benchmarks, financial benchmarks, cost of production benchmarks, and then what we call cost centers. So hay 
and replacement heifers. Um, we are working to expand these buckets into a, a grazing bucket and to a human capital bucket to just be more hol holistic in terms of tracking things and, and relating things back to profitability. Here's a snapshot of, now this does not, be careful looking at this, this is not the state of Colorado, um, the ranching demographics, this is the demographics of the folks of those 30 plus places that we have worked with to, to collect this information. This is where the results are coming from. Um, and so from a geographic standpoint, we've done a, I think a fairly nice job, uniform job of covering the state from, from all the way down in the Southeast to all the way up in the Northwest and everywhere in between. So you can see the percentages there. Um, a majority of our folks, uh, obviously cattle is the, the major source of revenue and that's one of our key components to selecting a place. Um, we didn't think of, we didn't try this or work on this, but man, there was a nice even distribution of size um, from small to large um, operations that we're working with. Um, everybody, this was interesting, everybody's, every place is third generation or greater, which um, obviously we know is not an easy task to, to achieve anymore. Um, another interesting point there is that most of our most of our places operate 60%, roughly 60% operate mostly off of leased land, which is different than, than a lot of other states. So that was an interesting component as well. And then um, at this point, most of our places have, the, the operators have 20 plus years, 70% of folks have 20 plus years of experience and so highly experienced folks. So this is where the data that I'm about to show you is coming from. Um, let's think about those production metrics first. So if you look, and again, I gotta go quick through these, I'm, I apologize. Um, so if you look at those first three categories, um, pregnancy, calving, weaning, um, that's basically, right? That's all the things that it takes to, to, to sell a calf. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, unless you're below the median on those things, um, most folks in the state don't have a problem. Production efficiency remains a challenge for few, but, for, but not for most. And I would also challenge folks to think it, you know, if you're if you're above the median or in that top group, just be careful on pushing on those numbers any higher because we really need to consider the cost to improve these things. Um, and, and what we're finding is the most, I, I know this is counterintuitive, but what we're finding is the most productive ranch may not be the most profitable. Um, so just be careful. Think about what it costs to move some of these numbers up. Um, obviously, if you're below the median, on some of these production things, that's a first. That's a first place to look. That's a critical step to to, to improvement. But if you're median and above on a lot of these, uh, just be careful on 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 you know what it's going to cost you to to move those things up. And then you can see um, we've got you know 120, 130 pound difference from top 30 percent to bottom 30 percent in in some of those weaning weight numbers. Again, be careful on pushing pushing these numbers any higher if you're in that top to median group. Uh, if you're in the bottom group, you may have some room for improvement there. Um, so on this screen, if you were to point out one number, for us, a, a, one of the key KPIs is pounds weaned per exposed female. And we're, we're calling that target somewhere in the 480 to 500 pound range um, is, a, is a good target to have. Um, but again, this is, this is not a profitability metric necessarily. This is an efficiency metric. So let's look at some of the financial metrics we're, we're seeing. So two things here, um, there's a lot more. I'm, I'm just kind of highlighting the keys here. Um, again, financial situation was number one barrier to success. Look at the ranch net income piece there. Now this is ranch net income. So this is all enterprises, not just cow-calf. But we've got, gosh, what is this? Uh, uh, 190 to $200,000 difference from top group to bottom group in terms of annual ranch net income. Um, and then you got the median sitting there right at right at basically break even. Um, so huge differences in ranch net income. Uh, the point here is, gosh, if, if, if you start to put some of the pieces together right, ranching can be profitable. That, that first group is, is, I mean, that's making, you know, a significant amount of money there. Um, and then if we think about return on assets is, is our other financial uh, key performance indicator here. Gosh, another huge difference between top and bottom, what is that, 11 to 12% in return on assets from top to bottom. Um, again, this is, a, this is really your measure of, of how you're utilizing your resources on your ranch. And this is something 
that we should all be measuring over time because the, the, to, to be honest, this negative return on assets is the driving, the long-term driving force behind decline in cow numbers. Cause you can only do that. You can only do negative return on assets so long before uh, you know, the resources will be used for something else. So huge differences in, in financial metrics, um, but, but ranching can be profitable. Um, this is one that just came to light as we were looking, as we started doing this analysis. Um, and it's this idea of fixed versus variable expenses as a percentage of your total costs. Um, our top group ranges in that 50-50 that range to the bottom group is more 70% fixed costs or overheads versus 30% variable costs. And this is important. This is, this is a key to profitability in my mind as we've started to analyze this. Um, and as you think about going through inventory fluctuations due to drought, due to markets, whatever it might be, um, those fixed costs, those overheads are really hard to change. And the only way to drive down those costs is to spread over more units. And so as we see those inventory fluctuations, those folks that are more 50-50 in terms of fixed versus variable costs are able to weather those, those storms um, more effectively. And so this is something to keep an eye on, something we're tracking pretty closely. Um, let's look at the cost. Of, this is the slide everybody wants to see. Um, gosh, historically, what would we say? It was a dollar a day to raise, uh, to, to run a cow. So $365 a year, um, uh, things have changed. Uh, so total cost on a cow will, will continue to rise, unfortunately, just purely due to inflation. But look at the difference from top to bottom here in, in, our, in our state. We've, our top group's sitting at about $800 to run a cow um, versus $1,325 or so in that bottom group. So $525 per cow difference from top to bottom. So huge variation in cow costs. And again, these are just the median numbers within each, each category. Um, we had a, a, you know, several folks um, way below that $800 number. Um, uh, as you're thinking about what makes up this number, we call it the big four. And so it's, it's depreciation, feed, labor, and pasture. If we're thinking about, you know, what's the target for total cow cost for, for an operation, we're looking at that $900 range would be, a, would be a good number to have in mind, especially given the way markets are moving. Um, you stand to make a little bit money, a little bit of money if you're, you're kind of in that range. So let's look at what makes up that, that total number. Uh, and we won't go into much detail other than pull out. Depreciation is the number one expense in our analysis. Um, and if you think about depreciation, what makes up that, it's primarily cow costs or, or the livestock piece. And then you can see feed, labor, and pasture. The big four make up uh, anywhere from 55 to 75% of your, your total cow costs. Um, here is, uh, this really highlights the, 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 the need to focus on costs. You can see there's about $120 per hundredweight difference in, in costs per hundredweight on operations versus, what is that, about a $15 per hundredweight difference in price received for calves. And so really, you know, cost is, is your leverage. Um, so the, the most leverage is on the cost side, obviously. Um, just a couple more here. Um, we're tracking graze versus fed days on places. And so this is our only grazing metric, but it's been really neat to, to sort of highlight. Um, but you gotta be careful here because there is a difference between ranches on the, the Eastern Plains versus West Slope. Um, but we're seeing anywhere from 50% um, grazing to, to 92 and a half percent um, grazing days. And this directly relates to feed costs, obviously. Um, and then I, I didn't include replacement heifers, but here's, uh, you know, another big question we ask when we go to places is, should you buy or raise hay yourself? And then there's a big difference in, in cost of production among places. Um, this, is, this is driven a lot by weather and yield, obviously, and we've had some crazy weather changes from 2018 to, to 2021, um, but you can see there's a big, the point here is know what it, what it really costs you to make hay, because a lot of folks think that they're making it cheap, but, but it's not, um, and you might be better off buying it somewhere else. Um, so concluding comments, um, so given all that, if you take a step back, really what we've seen for, for keys to profitability is gosh, you gotta have that, you gotta match stocking rate to carrying capacity. Again, that goes back to those fixed cost aspect. Um, you've got to wage a war on overhead costs because it is 55 to 75% of your total cost. Um, hey. Do you want your file cabinet as well? Or is that getting? 
Um, and then it's, again, it's not the most productive, but, but thinking about optimizing production versus, versus maximizing production, because it, what's it cost you to do that? Um, and in terms of proving management, record keeping, I will tell you record keeping is a waste of time unless you turn that information into wisdom, right? Or, and information that you can make decisions with. If you're just writing it in your red book and putting it in a file somewhere that did you no good. Um, good accounting systems are the key as we're working with folks. Um, and bench, I truly believe after doing this project for the last four years, benchmarking is a valuable decision tool. Um, th those results that I just shared with you are available in a digital copy. I'm happy to, to share that with you. We plan to update this every two years. And if you're interested in participating um, in this program, um, there's my email address. Um, shoot, me, shoot me a message or if you want the report. I have no idea what time it is. Sorry, I probably ran over. No, Ryan, you're good. Thank you. Um, it looks like we've got a couple of questions in the chat and just um, in essence of time, if you maybe would respond directly to those individuals, yeah. that would be yes, great. Yes, I will. Yep. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. So next on the agenda, we've got Becky Bollinger. She'll be talking to us about weather and climate outlook. Becky is the assistant state climatologist at, C at the Colorado Climate Center for CSU. Her interests include climate variability, climate trends, climate prediction, the hydrologic cycle, water resources, and climate and drought monitoring. She has worked for three different climate centers, has experience with many different climate, climate databases, and has experience with research and application in climate. Her expertise and passion is bridging the gap between climate research and decision-making applications. Take it away, Becky. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, see the screen okay? Assuming? Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to oh, talk a little you. bit about, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I wonder if your sound is a little bit garbly. So maybe that's a okay. set issue. Um, yeah, maybe I'll take out. Give me a second. Does that sound better now? It does. Yes. Go for it. Okay. And hopefully I'm loud enough. You are. Yeah. I got to figure out how to go back on my slides. There we go. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about the current weather conditions, climate conditions we're seeing around the state uh, and what that means as we go into the spring. I'm gonna start with where we are now and kind of look at not just the most recent month, but kind of since the beginning of the water year, what have we seen? So this is a map that shows uh, temperature ranks around the state for the period of October, October 1st through February 28th. And the ranking is based on the 128 years of data. And if you see the blues, that means it ranked on the colder side of those 128 years. So the little stats at the top tell us that it was the 22nd coldest in that 128 year record for that October through February time period. Um, and that is pretty notable. You know, maybe 22nd coldest doesn't sound that impressive, but considering that so many of our recent years are in the warmer ranks, uh, this stands out as definitely a, a colder fall and winter for us. Uh, so you'll see in the Northeast part of the state uh, where we had some of the coldest ranks uh, ranking in the in the top 20 to top 10, um, but mostly really cold throughout with some areas mostly showing up in the uh, white, which is that kind of near normal range. Shifting over to precipitation. So this is for that same period, October 1st through February 28th. And the dominant patterns that we'll really be focusing on are the fact that we've had some really good wet conditions in the western side of the state, uh, particularly if you get up near um, Moffitt County and Rio Blanco County, where they've had their record wettest 
October through February time period, but really all across uh, west of the divide, we're looking at those wetter conditions, which is really critical for that time of year. Uh, we've also seen wetter conditions in the northeastern part of the state. This is uh, pretty important because they were suffering through a very severe drought in the summer. So to be able to come out of that drought, and even though this is a drier time of year for the northeast corner of the state, to come out and, and get some more moisture um, has been helpful in some drought recovery. Uh, we have the worst conditions in our state in the southeastern corner and uh, the southern mountains around the wet mountains, Sangre de Cristos, a uh, little bit into the San Luis Valley. And a lot of this has been short term. Um, they weren't seeing these really bad drought conditions in the summer. So it's really been focused on that fall and winter time period. Uh, for the higher elevations, that's really bad for the lower elevations. Um, it's a drier time of year as well, so those will be deficits that will be easier to make up, but it's still a little bit of a stressful situation there, I'm sure. So this is a look at current snowpack as of the end of February from the NRCS. I've uh, made a nice little URL there that will take you to the Colorado Snow Survey page where you can always see this map or go to those snowpack graphics that uh, they update daily. So here we're looking at for each major basin in the state, where is snowpack currently at? And if you're in those blues, you're above the normal range. So everywhere west of the divide, we're looking at well above normal snowpack as of the end of February, which is really good news. Uh, as we go east of the divide, things get a little bit lower. Uh, the upper Rio Grande, the South Platte, much closer to near average. And then unfortunately the Arkansas Basin uh, not doing so well and at 77% of average. So we're gonna go through and look at some of these uh, specific basins. And what I'm gonna show you is where the snowpack currently is for that basin and then projections from historic data uh, so that we can see what's likely as we go through the rest of the cold season and approach the peak snowpack. So for this example, I'm starting with the Arkansas basin because I wanna get the bad news out of the way first and look at the better things later. Um, so what we're looking at, the black line is showing how the snowpack has accumulated since the beginning of the water year. The shading behind is the entire historical range for the Arkansas Basin. And then the skinny lines show you uh, kind of if we started on Mar March 1st and then took all the historical observations from March 1st and went forward in time, what would the snowpack look like? And then you can see there's a green line there of what is normal for the basin. So as of March 1st, we're at 78% of normal snowpack, uh, which falls in that yellow shading or the 19th percentile, so very dry. And then each of those colors that are coming out from the black line are those future projections based on historic data. So if you pick the blue line, that is you're assuming you're gonna have a much snowier, wetter than average um, time from March 1st through the end of the season. And if you follow that blue line, you'll notice it doesn't quite make it to that X. And that X is the normal peak value. And so what we're seeing is that even with much above average snowpack accumulation for the rest of the season, and we've got 35 days till we normally peak, um, that it's very unlikely we're going to get near or above average snowpack for the Arkansas Basin. If you follow the green lines, which are the 30th percentile, the 50th percentile, the 70th percentile, you'll see that it's most likely that they're going to peak below average, um, but they do still have the possibility of melting out near average time period. <clears throat> so we're going to shift to the west and look at where the Colorado headwaters is. And um, so the black line now shows that uh, snowpack is currently at 122% of normal. 
and they're already at 90% of their peak. So they're really close to their normal peak value and they still have 44 days until they reach a normal peak timing. And so again, if we follow those projection lines, you'll see that it's more likely that they will end with an above average peak snowpack um, and very less likely, in fact, almost unlikely that they will be a below average peak snowpack. So really good news there. Uh, the other one I'm picking is to look at the San Juan Basin, uh, which is really one of the most best performing basins for uh, this winter. They are currently at 140% of normal, and they are also above their normal peak. So their normal peak is somewhere around 17 inches, and they're already over 20 inches. And they still have 32 days to go before they reach their normal peak date. So we're looking really good there. Obviously, they'll be above average peak because they're already there. Um, and then what the future lines are showing that you could look at, though, is that if things shut off and it really warmed up and dried out, they could possibly still melt out early, which would have some negative impacts. But overall, uh, we're really confident that, that this is going to be uh, a good snowpack peak season, melting season for uh, the San Juan Basin and also for the Yampa Basin, which is also one of the best performing ones. So we want to know about snowpack because we want to know how that's going to translate into runoff and water supply. So this is looking at the latest uh, forecast as of March 1st from the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center. And every triangle is a point on the river or near a reservoir where they're doing a, a stream flow forecast or water supply forecast. So the triangles you can see if they're in a green or other cool color, blue, purple, that means they will have a near average to above average water supply. And that's what the forecast is for. And if it's a yellow triangle, it will be slightly below average to near average. So not too bad. Uh, best thing I can tell you about looking throughout Western Colorado is that we don't have any orange, red, or maroon triangles. Everywhere is looking really good. Where we're seeing those blues and purples are areas where we are expecting above normal uh, stream flow and water supply forecasts as we go into the spring and the summer. So that is really good news. Uh, it's meaning we're gonna have some decent recovery um, in our hydrologic situation to help us further recover from drought. So we're very interested in what does the soil moisture look like before we actually start accumulating that snowpack. Um, because that tells us if we are accumulating snowpack on top of really dry and stressed soils, the first place that snowpack is going to go when it starts melting and the ground starts thawing is into the soils and then there will be less available for runoff and water supply. So here is the soil moisture map for the upper Colorado River Basin as of November. And I know it does look a little bit dry with the yellows being below 100% of normal, the oranges being 70 to 90% of normal. But if you compare it to the four years before that, it actually looks downright amazing. Like we've had such incredibly bone dry soil that there was not a chance for the snowpack to really help us. And this is a better picture. And so even though there are some dry soils we're looking at, we will get more of that runoff to go into, um, we will get more of that melt, melting to go into runoff rather than the soils. We're saying goodbye to La Nina. And this is showing a from the Climate Prediction Center, the likelihood of getting uh, having a La Nina is blue, neutral conditions is gray, red is El Nino. And so we are transitioning out of La Nina now and we'll be going into neutral conditions for the rest of the spring. And I really wanna uh, hammer home what this means for our spring in that 
For our snowfall patterns, La Nina tends to favor the northern mountains with more snow and the southern mountains and plains with less snow. So this exiting La Nina could be better news for the southern mountains. So I'm going to shift to what the Climate Prediction Center outlooks are showing. This is very near term looking at the middle of March. What are we looking at? Uh, the left is the likelihood of uh, above or below normal temperatures, and the right is likelihood of above or below normal precipitation. So basically what I want to take home with this is we are going to con continue into the middle of March this colder pattern and we are also looking at wetter than average conditions being more likely, uh, which is really good news for continuing to accumulate that snowpack. I also want to point out that they show hazards for um, that 8 to 14 day outlook. And the hazards that they're showing are the risk of uh, really cold temperatures, so much below normal temperatures for the middle of March, and also the risk of heavy snow for all of Western Colorado. Uh, extending out and looking at the entire month of March, it's going to look a little bit similar to that, where you've got that leaning of colder than average temperatures, particularly to the northwest, wetter than average precipitation for a lot of western Colorado. And then shifting out and looking at the seasonal outlook, so this is looking at all of March, April, and May. Now we're looking at what they still are showing is a, a classic not La Nina pattern, which is that below average precipitation to the south in that right map, and then uh, warmer than average temperatures to the south on the map to the left. Uh, but overall, that is, uh, we haven't really been following that La Nina pattern for Southwest Colorado, maybe a little bit for Southeast Colorado, but that's what we're seeing there. What does this mean for drought? So I wanna talk about where we're currently at. This map was just released this morning. Uh, you can see that most of Western Colorado not showing any drought categories. And then as we move East, we're seeing a uh, dominant D1 drought uh, with a little bit of worse drought conditions around Pueblo and surrounding areas. And also on the far Eastern site of the state, we've got that shorter term drought in Southeast Colorado, longer term exiting drought in Northeast Colorado. So based on all the forecasts and what we're seeing, it is likely that those drought-free conditions in Western Colorado are going to continue. Uh, unless we get an amazing spring, which is always possible, um, that we're going to see the severity of drought increase into uh, more parts of Southeast Colorado as we move through the spring. And depending on what the storm activity looks like, we could see more improvement in Northeast Colorado. The reason we haven't seen total improvement is because those wetter conditions came at such a dry time of year for them. So final key points to hit on, snowpack, really good condition, uh, good chance for normal peak date and normal melting. The Arkansas Basin is the one exception to that, and it's very likely that that is going to be the area of concern throughout the spring and into the summer. Uh, that's where the highest risk of continuing and worsening drought remains. As always, no matter where you are, though, things can change quickly in Colorado. That's all I have. Uh, hopefully time for questions, but I'll stay on the chat, too. Thank you so much, Becky. We appreciate that. And, and that is good news. It's nice to see all of that good information. Um, I went ahead and put in the chat that we will go ahead and take a break until 1130. Uh, Becky, if you can stick around and just monitor the chat for any questions that come your way. Um, we'll Absolutely. allow the speakers to answer those questions in the chat. And we're just going to keep rolling along. So with that, we'd like That's to uh, take a break. And we'll see you all back here at 1130 promptly. Thanks, Becky. Great stuff. Thank you.
All right, welcome back everyone. Hopefully you had a, a chance to take a quick break. Um, all right, our next speaker, we've got Caitlin uh, McClock and she will be giving a presentation on market outlook. Caitlin is the director and senior agricultural economist at the Livestock Marketing Information Center. Caitlin has expertise in the cattle, hog, dairy, hay and grain sectors covering market analysis and outlook. Caitlin has published through a variety of channels, market analysis, research, and news articles. She has been a frequent presenter on the national and regional levels, as well as through rural media, media outlets. All right, take it away, Caitlin. Does that look good, Megan? See my screen and everything? It does, okay. yeah. Great. Well, we're going to jump right in as we don't have much time today. Uh, the key punchline, I guess, if you want to just write one thing down is that we're very bullish on prices, whether it's crop prices, hay prices, cattle prices, beef prices. Um, the bad news is probably all your inputs are going up as well. And so as much as high prices might sound good, it's maybe not all rosy because those inputs are likely going to stay high as well. Those of you that aren't familiar with LMIC, we are a cooperative nonprofit between USDA, land grant universities, they're highlighted in green, and then industry associations, which I'm sure some of you have interacted with in the past. So let's get started with hay. This is the December 1 hay stock map based on last year's production, and this is how much hay was on hand nationally. Um, these are in percent changes, so we we're about 9% down from last year. This is roughly 6% below where we were in the last lowest number, which was 2011 or 12. We're about 6% off of those numbers. And you can just see by the red spaces on this map how low those stocks have really gotten in the southern and central plains of the country. And what I would say is, and, and Becky kind of went over some of the reasons why we've seen that, some of the blue numbers are acting like we saw big increases, but keep in mind, a lot of these areas have had year over year of drought. And so even if they were up from a year ago, their stock levels probably still are not very high. This is by far the lowest aggregate total hay stock number since the 1950s. And so we really are in a somewhat desperate situation for hay. But again, hay is very regional. Colorado listed at 33% down from a year ago. 35% down in Nebraska, 18% around Kansas. And you can just see that that Southern Plains drought has really just sucked hay from a lot of the surrounding area. And just for perspective purposes, Texas is the easily one of the top two hay producing states in the country. And so when they have a problem, it really draws hay from all over the country. On a normal year, they're producing about eight to 10% of total US hay production. And so some of the changes have been because of the hay production, I mentioned Texas is a is a big hay producing state. So for them to be down 40% is an enormous decline. Um, some of that is going to be on the yield side. Some of that is going to be on the acreage side. Most of the other hay production problems we saw were based on yields. Um, we did see quite a bit off. And in Colorado, 28% loss there in, hay, in other hay production. So that's anything that's a non-alfalfa variety is how they classify that at NAS. For alfalfa production, that was probably the bigger shock to me. This is a lot more to do with acres since most of the alfalfa is going to be irrigated, but widespread declines here, but down only about 2.6% compared to last year. And so that's what we're starting the year with. So the hay marketing year starts on May 1, and so we're coming towards the end of the last one, and what we saw were record high prices. Uh, this is easily taking out anything we saw uh, in 2011 through 13. Colorado, you're sitting about 265. This blue line is going to be the national average. So you're pretty close to where the national average is right now. We're not anticipating any sort of break in the hay price for those of you trying to buy hay um, next year until probably well into the summer. I think it's going to take more than one cutting to, to get you up there. Um, and unfortunately, the stock situation is tight enough that I just, I don't think one season worth of growing, even if it was an excellent year, will really drop that hay price down, that alfalfa price down to, let's call it a normal level, anything even close to last year. So we would expect it to kind of stay in this mid 200 range. Maybe it won't be as nether season average high, but looking at pretty high prices. Great news for those of you selling hay, bad news for you, those of you buying hay. 
Other hay is a pretty similar situation. In this, in this instance, Colorado is well above the national average. Um, I clocked yet 250 at ag prices that came out yesterday, but the national average is closer to 175 at this point. Other hay is a little bit harder to predict because you can group in a lot of different things. CRP can come into play, but again, I just don't think the, depending on um, how the moisture pans out, how many yields we can get, Fertilizer was a big deal last year, as well as fuel costs. We saw people cut back on both the number of times they wanted to cut, as well as what those application rates were. Some of that'll change. I mean, fertilizer prices right now are looking a little bit lower and fuel prices come down a little bit, but probably not to see this price drop back, you know, to that five-year average again within one growing season. Pretty big difference here, right? Non-irrigated acres are really at the mercy of what mother nature brings into play. And so we'll have to wait and see if we really exit this La Nina phase, if it's more neutral, um, if we still have pocketed problems in the Southern Plains, if it moves more towards the Corn Belt, all of those will shape this season. But essentially what we're looking at is probably high prices until I'm thinking more like July or August before you really see a break. Um, but hopefully uh, things do settle down within two marketing years. So look for those price declines to maybe come more like 2024 or 2025 as we build that forage base back up. On the cattle side of things, beef cow slaughter has been one of the big keys to the market in the last three years. Very large numbers moving through the system. Started this year, we did see, we started out pretty high again, but have come down. That's not that unexpected. This is that time of year where um, you know, it would be rare to see a lot of cow culling when you're calving. And so seasonally, we're going to watch this through the summer. And a lot of that's going to depend on what those pasture and range conditions could carry. And again, it's not going to be something that I think within one year will be rather optimistic to see those stocking densities come, come up to back to a normal level. But I think you're going to hear more about that after my talk. Um, but nationally, I just think we're still in a position where you're going to see a little bit more culling, probably not as much as last year, but this cow slaughter is going to be one we continue to watch too, to see how much retention is happening. The big change between this cattle cycle and the last one is going to be your, how many heifers have exited that replacement uh, stream. So much higher percentages moving on feed than they were, you know, back in 2012 and 13. We're sitting at about 40% and have been at a very high level now for several months. Now, what that tells me is this cattle cycle isn't going to turn very fast because we've stripped away those younger animals uh, down to a very low level. So probably looking at this cattle cycle turning not until 2025 is what we're putting in there. And this blue line is that cattle inventory. So we just got a new, a new number here for January 1. It was down about 4%. Those heifers tell me that heifer percent on feed tells me that we're just not retaining very much in any sort of large degree. So what we have in here in that purple dot is kind of our estimate is another one and a half to 2% decline probably in 2023. 2024, it's a little far out for right now for me to, to think about. You might plateau, it might be down a little bit, um, but I'm not really looking for this cattle inventory to increase year over year until 2025. The bars behind this chart are our estimated cow-calf returns. Now this is different than what Ryan just presented. Uh, this is a spreadsheet calculation that we put together for assumptions. So it's not aggregating together producers. Um, and it's more of a barometer. You know, I wouldn't look at this and say, you know, someone is actually making each individual dollar as much as gray bars mean it was a good year where you made money. Red bars mean it was um, not so great a year and you probably lost money. Now this doesn't include government payments. And so it's not all inclusive the way maybe um, the Colorado State benchmark is, but that's going to be much closer to what you guys are experiencing than this. This is just to give you an idea. Um, we are expecting cow-calf returns to continue to improve over the next two years, largely due to calf price. We have calf prices moving higher and higher and higher. And we think those cull values are also going to stay in there relatively good as long as uh, people keep buying ground beef, which I think they will based on where the economy is going right now. Here's our estimates for um, annual beef production. So we're down about 4% in 2023. Some of that's gonna be um, a slowdown in cow slaughter. Some of that's gonna be a slowdown in heifer slaughter. 
and then a big drop in 2024. So a big slaughter reduction there based on just more and more heifers being held back and more cows being retained. So less culling going on. And the chart behind kind of that orange box is just to show you how productive our beef system is. And in previous times when we've seen inventory decline, you can see that 2014 was the last very low point. We never quite came back to the previous high of the that previous cattle cycle back in, let's see, 2007. I wouldn't expect us to necessarily come back to our previous levels either, just because on a per animal basis, we are improving that efficiency um, pretty close to annually. So here's our, um, and we do do a Southern Plains estimate. And, and so it's a little different from what you guys are looking at, but essentially we have about a 10% increase in price this year from last year and closer to five to 10% in the following two years. Um, I think you're gonna take out at some point the 2015 highs, um, but probably not till 2025. It's really hard to guess maybe the timing of these things we're looking at, we probably have a little bit of a conservative price in here right now, but that's just the way that, go, that goes. While you're chasing inventory down, you tend to chase prices up. And when you're chasing inventory up, you're chasing prices down. So I put on here your current market, this was last week's average for five to six weeks, you're at 211 and seven to eights, you're at 184. Now, if you think about where the board is, where the CME is, um, a lot of optimism built in that seven to 800 pound contract right now. Uh, fall is topping. I think it was at 215 when I looked or 216 a couple minutes ago. And so that's really, that's really bidding on the corn price. Um, having a great year, which if we flip to El Nino, that's, that's definitely possible. Um, but if we don't, I would expect that price to stay below 200 in, in the cash market, but we'll just have to wait and see. Some of these things are still very much up in the air. The bottom line is cattle supplies are tightening, tightening over, over this long period of time, and we don't expect them to increase for several years out. And what that does is it increases your prices across the board, whether you're talking about five to six weights or seven to eights or fed steer prices. And so at some point, it probably won't matter as much what corn price is when those cattle supplies get so tight that they're not necessarily driving off that feed function. I don't think we're quite there yet this year. And so I would expect that feeder cattle market, especially those heavier weights to react a little bit more to corn price this year, but that might not be what we see next year and in 2025. Really quickly on the meat demand side. Um, so this is the export graph. We had two record high export years um, in 2021 and 2022. I have us backing off a little bit, largely because of where the world is recessionary wise. But again, not a huge decline, still outpacing 2020 and, tw and 2019. Um, we do have 2024 being a bit lower. I think that might be a little too low, especially if this recession is fairly short-lived and we see the world economy spring back to life. Um, I could easily see that being quite a bit higher. On the import side, I don't want anyone to get scared about this chart, but this is roughly what happened you know, back in 2014 and 15, we started importing a lot more product when we had very short supplies. We're gonna have very short supplies too, based on our forecast of a 4% reduction in 2023 and a 7.5% reduction in 2024. I think we're gonna import a lot more, you know, 10 to 15% more a year. That doesn't see, I would, that's, I shouldn't scare anyone because it's gonna be because we need the beef here and our consumers are demanding it. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that we import beef and, and I'll tell you that what we don't want is beef, pr beef price at the grocery store to get so high people stop buying it. And when you have imports coming in, that'll alleviate some of that pressure. But again, it usually, sh it usually will rip back down as soon as our cattle price, or as soon as our cattle inventory turns, we get those production numbers back up. But this is what we have in here. Probably the bigger question is, can the world supply that much beef? Um, there was a case of BSC in Brazil, which means we're going to go to regionalization there and not be able to import as much product. Um, New Zealand, Australia, another key import markets for us. Um, we'll have to see what their weather holds. But essentially, I would look, I would expect us to import quite a bit more beef when, when our beef prices are as high as we're expecting them to be. And they are pretty high, right? We're at 285 or so. This is the choice cutout. This is the negotiated price right here. Seasonally rallying a little bit. Um, 
slightly different pattern than last year. But one thing to take away from last year is that we were relatively flat in the terms of we didn't follow the normal, typical seasonal pattern. And I would expect that to also hold this year where we're going to bounce around quite a bit. Um, Brewing season, I expect strong demand to continue. The big question is, where is that? Where is that? ceiling? How high can this product go in the current environment? And a lot of that's going to have depend on where the U.S. economy is and how the consumer is. And if we had a lot more time, I could take you through a lot more charts. But essentially, the, the financial aspect of the U.S. consumer is going to be what shapes this cut at this demand at the retail level and wholesale realm. Level. We are storing quite a bit of beef. I would guess some of this is speculative. Um, some of this might be imports. We don't know. They don't break it out like that. This isn't at a worrisome level yet, but it's something we're watching. So if we start to see this continue to build, even in a short supply environment, that would that would indicate to me that there might be a little bit of a demand problem. So something to watch, but I don't think we're there at a point where I'm, I'm necessarily worried at this point. For retail price comparison, I already mentioned uh, the U.S. consumer. This is where, this is a number that we get from ERS, USDA ERS. It's basically an aggregate number. So it, it combines all the cuts and all the all the grades into one number so that people like me can talk about it easier. So we're holding a pretty high value and have been for about a year. Chicken also is a record high value, pork record high value. But the big conversation I have with you know non-ag groups is all about eggs, right? The eggs are the, one of the cheapest sources of protein, but they're not anymore. On a per pound basis, they are now a lot more expensive than chicken on a retail price. So I just put in here roughly what our eggs are at our grocery store. And it's, you know, if you put it on a per pound basis, we're looking at somewhere between four and five bucks. So very close to pork price. And this is what's really going to start coming home to producers is when they're, or excuse me, consumers, when they start paying out of pocket for this for a prolonged period of time. Now the Federal Reserve increased rates again, quarter of a percent in February, um, less than they had been, but it was still an increase. And I think we're gonna still battle this inflation. I think food inflation is here to stay because all the meat products are basically in a contractionary phase. HPAI and eggs, everything is gonna stay relatively expensive. And from a relative perspective in the meat case, Beef is one of those higher ticket items. Now demand has held up really well, so it's not a it's not a scary thing yet. Um, but you have to wonder how high that beef price can go, and people will continue to buy it. Um, but other prices have increased too. But this is kind of an interesting chart and interesting to talk about eggs um, in light of some of these other proteins. And with that, I think I left a few moments for questions. But if not, I can answer them in the chat or sign off. Perfect. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat as of yet. Um, and just a reminder, everyone, that the presentations and the, the chat session will be available um, on the ABM website. So if there's anything that you think you missed, you can go back and review it then. Um, okay, moving along, we've got John Ritten talking about stocking density. Dr. John Ritten is an ag economist at CSU and a member of the AgNext team. He received a BS in marketing from Arizona State University, an MBA from New Mexico State University, and a PhD in natural resource economics from Colorado State University. His research interests include the intersection of ag production and natural resource management. Prior to joining AgNext, John served at the University of Wyoming State Ag Systems Extension Specialist for 14 years. Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to be back at, in Colorado. Um, as was mentioned, I was up at Wyoming for about 14 years, but I never really stopped working down here. So it's good, good to be back. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about some work we've been doing for the last decade or so, but on the other side of the mountain from you guys. Um, still think there's some lessons to be learned though. And so we've been looking at, um, really working with a, a, a bunch of stakeholders to try to figure out adaptive grazing, right? And so looking at increased stock density and a rotational um, management plan for, in this case, yearling steers, and it's up in northeastern Colorado. Um, and what we really try to do is, is there's a lot of debate, I would say, about increased stock density and what it can or can't do and what's realistic. And we really wanted to go beyond just kind of the typical research farm 
here at a university and do it at a ranch level. And so we have 11 stakeholders that help us manage this project, um, ranging from ranchers who actually have their livestock in the research project um, to state and federal agency uh, personnel, as well as some, some NGOs as well to help manage. And we're actually managing for multiple objectives on this. I won't talk about other than the beef production, but we do also try to get bird habitat as well as species composition as far as forage production to change over time to make this ranch more resilient. Um, and, and more productive over time. Um, but just to give you an idea of where this ranch is at, um, it's part of the Pawnee National Grassland. So it's the ARS Central Plains Experimental Range. So the short grass, um, you know, north of Greeley is probably the closest town or just, just south of Cheyenne on east of, of Highway 85. And this is what this looks like. And this is what I mean by ranch scales. So we have 10 pastures for each treatment and we're really comparing adaptive um, rotational management versus continuous season long, which is really the the status quo in this part of the state. And so each of these 10 pastures is 320 acres. So we've got a 3,200 acre ranch that we're managing. And again, we've got the control, which is traditional season long. We kick yearlings out kind of middle of May and we bring them back um, middle of October. And then that rotation really is where, um, looking at how do we manage the system um, adaptively to try to meet our production, production and, and conservation goals. And they do have the same stocking rate across systems. Again, this is one of the things that a lot of the published research confounds is they have different stocking rates. So we have the same number of animals in the control and the treatment. Um, but what that means is we have 10 times stock density, right? So we put all of the animals in one pasture at a time on that rotation, and we move them through those pastures um, based on a couple of things, um, a couple of different metrics. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. We also do allow the stakeholders to decide to burn or not and where to burn either for a fall patch burn or a spring patch burn. But keep in mind, we only burn 80 acres at a time and we do it on both the control and the treatment to try to figure out the effects of that. So again, 80 acres isn't a huge issue, but we do think we've seen some impact from that. I'll, I'll talk briefly about that as we get farther along. The, the really fun part of this is, is as those stakeholders have to decide, should we rest pastures or not? Um, there's a couple of reasons they would. One is to keep um, taller structure out there for certain bird species, but mainly it, it really comes down to can we leave some some forage out there um, as as a grass banking for a drought management um, tool, and then once they figure out you know should we rest pastures and which ones and we've got some heterogeneity in the pastures, how do we rotate through and why? And we really make them document their their decision making so we can tease out you know why, why these decisions happened. And here's just a graphical representation of it. Um, again, season long on the left, TRM, we call it traditional ranch land management, because again, that is really kind of the status quo in that part of the state. And CARM, which is this collaborative adaptive range land management. And, and just to kind of show you how those animals are grouped, but also I want to point out those blue dots. Those are the water placement. And so the fencing was already there for this, this trial. And I'll talk about how some infrastructure costs can, can play a role in whether or not this pays. But we did have to go back in and, and put in larger water tanks in this rotational um, strategy because the existing water tanks just couldn't handle 280 steers in some years, right? So we had to go out and spend some money to, to increase the, the water availability to make sure those animals got through, specifically the, the summer months where it gets pretty hot and dry out in that part of the state. And here's just a quick example of what happened in 2016. Um, they decided to rest three pastures for various reasons. And, and again, this was about five years into the treatment and they learned that we're gonna start that season on some of our cooler season pastures. Pastures are dominated by cool season grasses, really take advantage of that more nutritious um, quality early on, go out to our warm season pastures for, for the hotter parts of the months. And then before we come back in and, and gather those animals, we're gonna put them back on some cool season grasses because we tend to get that green up later in the season and really benefit from that increased forage quality. Um, and so one question we always get asked on this is, have we actually impacted forest production? Have we increased forest production by increasing the stock density and forcing animals to eat um, more grass? Can we change that? And so this graph is on, on the x-axis is the years. So I've got eight years of data on here. And this is um, average forest production across all 10 pastures by treatment. So those black lines is that rotation. Those gray lines are the continuous season long. And you can see that we had really four wet years two kind of dry years and one really big drought represented in this data set and one year which was average, which in most of my work, I've been working in livestock and, and grazing systems for almost 20 years now, you never see an average year. So it was great to see an actual average year, but there's really no trend here, right? It, it, there's not a lot of difference for one and we haven't been increasing or decreasing one or the other based simply on the, the management itself. Um, 
And so then the next question is, again, we have three of the stakeholders are actually ranchers and, and it is their animals in the research tri trial. So we want to know about animal performance, right? So this is those same graphs and we've got those same colors up on top. Um, and this is individual average daily gain, right? And so the numbers on the very top up here, um, didn't get that yet, but those are the, the stocking rates. So we've gone anywhere from 214 animals across 3,200 acres up to 280 back in 2018. I will say that consistently we're about 16% lower animal performance with this increased stock density. And that's really because we're, we're forcing those animals to, to consume less nutritious forage, right? We're, we're making them clean up everything out in that pasture before we move them on. And so it's probably unexpected. The one year where that didn't happen was in 2020, which is the first drought year of this, this study. But if you look at 2019 to 2020, we have the same stocking rate. So it's not that this adaptive management this rotational strategy helped us get through the drought. It's just the decrease wasn't as deep as it was for that continuous season long, right? They still performed worse in the drought than they did the year before. And I also add that in 2020, the, stock, the stakeholders decided that one big herd at 10X stock density might be too much. They actually split into two herds each at 5X density. So we've got the drought impacting the numbers here, but also they backed off that stock density because they just couldn't quite get um, the animal gains that they were hoping for. And so again, both in 2020 and 2021, we have 5X density instead of 10X, and we carried that forward into 2022 as well. Here's a graph that we've updated every year. This is just from 2018, but it's a similar um, uh, effect every year we've done this. And so on the X axis here is stock density, so number of animals per 320 acre pasture. And we have individual animal performance across the season on the y-axis. And this top left dot is our season-long continuous herd. The bottom right is our CARM herd. These two intermediate um, dots are other long-term experiments going on at the same research station. Again, kind of ranch level research. And we see consi consistently that as we increase stock density, we negatively impact individual animal performance. But over time, as a stakeholder group has learned how to manage adaptively in response to changing precipitation events and forage production, we think they've actually increased gains by about 4% over just a random rotation. And so there is something to be said for this, you know, um, local knowledge and understanding the system and know how to manage your animals in response to changing environmental conditions. Um, so again, what if we back off this? We went from 10x to 5x in, in 2020. I'm going to show you the data from this last year. I haven't included my other slides because we haven't done all the analysis yet. But we have that continuous season long on the left and that CARM herd on the right. Again, adaptive rotation. Um, and again, this is the average of those two herds. It's essentially a wash. And so it looks like we did pretty good. But again, 2020 was a drought year. So again, in, in 2020, when we had a drought, CARM actually outperformed the season long. 2022, pretty similar story. There wasn't much difference, but we think that's because of the drought. And I will also say that this is only the first three months of the grazing season. We actually had to pull the animals off at the end of July because we ran out of, uh, out of grass. We don't know what would have happened at the end of the, the grazing season. This is just what happened through July. What we found in looking at the data though, was that, so this is just the continuous season long. Um, we have five pastures that are really loamy soil type pastures, and we have five that are either mixed or sandy. And animal performance in the drought year really was impacted by that, that the soils within those pastures and, and the associated forage production. So those loamy soils, which typically are more productive in, in average or wet years in this part of the state, and the dry years are really hit hard as far as animal production, whereas those mi mixed and sandy pastures tended to outperform what is, again, those loamies are usually more, more productive in this part of the state. And it just turned out we actually didn't do this on purpose, but the two car were split up. One spent most of their time on the loamy pastures and the other was on those sandy and mixed. And we see the same phenomenon happen there. So if we, we have this kind of nice natural experiment that we weren't planning on, but we have the loamy soil continuous herd versus that loamy soil rotational herd. And we see a pretty big benefit here in terms of average daily gains on those, again, less productive pastures in the drought so we, we really do attribute that to the benefits of CARM. There's a little bit of patch burn uh, effect there too, because we did actually burn um, that fall before. And so there's a lot of green up and the stakeholders put those animals out on that burn pasture early in the season to get take advantage of, of that green up um, early in the season. So only one of the five continuous season long herds actually got that benefit. 
But if you look at those um, more productive pastures in the drought, those mixed and sandy soils, the continuous season long actually outperformed our, our rotation. So a bit of a mixed bag as to results. So again, I'm not a range scientist. I'm also not an animal scientist. I'm an economist by training. So the question I'm usually asked is, does it pay? And so we, we approach this a couple different ways. The first thing I would ask producers if they want to implement one of these ideas is, how are you marketing your animals? And so most of the people out um, in Northeast Colorado, at least part of the, the Pawnee National Grassland and Curl Valley Livestock are contracting cattle, right? And so this is important. Um, hopefully Caitlin's right. And we have, you know, increasing prices for the next few years to help us all out. But again, if I contract cattle at a certain weight, most of the contracts the, of the producers I work with have a one-way price slide. I mean, if they come in too heavy, I take a little bit of a discount. If they come in underweight, I don't get any sort of premium on a price per hundred weight for those animals. And so that's the first scenario I'm going to model for you. But then we also went back and looked at, what well, what if I just took these to the sale barn and where I do get that differential price where lighter weight cattle get a slightly higher price per pound? And I'll show you the impacts from that as well. Oh, there we go. Um, and so this is the ending value. This isn't the true profitability measure. To start with, I'm just going to show you what those animals were worth when they came off pasture in October, each of the first eight years. And if there's no price slide, and so that every animal got the same price per pound, and we know that those adaptive rotational um, managed animals were lighter, there's a pretty big difference. Um, it's easier to show on this slide, I think the per head difference over eight years was about $65 per head um, in decreased revenue from those animals that were on that rotation. Um, 2020 was an odd year, but again, that's during that drought where no one performed well and it was only 5x density. If we go back to that 10x density from 2014 to 2019, there's a significant um, revenue difference for the herds that were under that rotation. If we put a price slide in and actually say those lighter animals got a slightly higher price per pound, um, the difference is still there, just not quite as stark. So for 2014 to 2019, again, those years where we had 10x density, it's about $25 per head difference. In 2020 and 2021, um, again, part of this is only 5x density. And so some of those differences washed away. Um, something to think about as I come back to the cost side in just a minute. And so a lot of producers ask us to say, is this profitable or not? Um, it doesn't typically make as much money. Again, assuming stocking rate is fixed. A lot of people that will include one of these rotational um, Management plans will actually increase stocking rate to offset some of that. But for a fixed stocking rate, you, you bring in less money typically. But the cost, you really need to figure out your infrastructure, right? And so it depends. In this case, we modeled it for these 10 dispersed pastures, right? And the water that would be required to include um, to allow for that increased stock density. Whereas um, if you're thinking about subdividing a larger pasture, um, is that going to be permanent barbed wire? Are you going to use electric fence? What does that look like? And then labor. And I will say going in, I was a little ignorant. I thought that these rotational systems would have a lot higher labor requirements. But if we look at the annual cost of labor for this specific ranch level experiment in Northeast Colorado, labor costs are a lot lower for the rotation. And it really comes down to the weekly checking of cattle. I have to go out to one pasture and check, not 10. And so there's a lot less um, labor hours uh, each week just going out to check health and, and herd status. That's not necessarily going to be the same difference, or at least the magnitude of difference, if you're doing a cross fence um, of an existing larger pasture, but that's what we uh, experienced for this, um, this treatment. But still, total annual grazing system costs, so if we amortize all those infrastructure investments, specifically the water placement, it is still slightly more costly for this 10 dispersed pasture rotation mechanism, because we have the the decreases in labor do not offset the increase in infrastructure required to implement this the first time. So overall, the, it wasn't profitable, but we always try to figure out what would make it profitable. So how would I make this pay, right? Across, we analyzed five different scenarios. Um, again, with a fixed stocking rate, just changing stock density, we saw anywhere from a five to 25% decrease in overall profitability with rotational grazing, but cost share might actually cover the difference. But again, it's operationally dependent. And so if you have these dispersed pastures and a lot of beginning ranchers uh, I was working with in Wyoming and some in, in Colorado and, and Kansas really are, are in the, the process now of buying animals and renting land. So they do have these dispersed pastures. It's more likely that you can make this pay if you get some equip payments or, or, or the like to help cover those infrastructure investments. Um, 
but you also need to account for lower weights when contracting and marketing. It, it was more likely to pay if you knew those animals were lighter coming off and you contracted accordingly or you sold them um, at the sale bar. And so a few things that we've learned real quick before I wrap up is that over 10 years now, we, we have proven that, that the rotational um, management system leads to lower cattle gains, right? So that's continuous season long has increased gains, again, for this a fixed stocking rate. And that's because they're able to be more selective in, in their diet. Um, even though forage production was the same, we, we haven't really seen much divergence in forest species composition. We might start to see a few more cool season grasses coming into some of those carm pastures, um, but not enough to really be excited about yet. But the big difference here is we actually had grad students out there doing fecal measurements. So go out there every week and, and figure out, back calculate what those animals are eating. And diet quality was much higher for those season long animals. Again, just reinforcing the fact that they can be more selective in their diet. So diet quality is the key driver of weight gains um, in the non-drought years. The reasons we didn't see the performance differences as much in, in 2020 or 2022 is there just wasn't much protein out there to begin with. So those animals, just, no animal could perform well. There wasn't enough for anyone to be selective. They were all basically eating the, the leftovers and scraps. And so a few broader lessons learned before I wrap this up is that if you're thinking about implementing the strategy and you haven't figured out how to make it work to, to offset those decreased animal gains is really think about um, if I'm contracting, maybe back off your weights for a couple of years just to make sure that, that you're not going to get hit with, with a discount um, if you bring in lighter animals. And rotation allows for drought, ad drought ad adaptation, regardless of if you have a price light or not. Um, but again, it wasn't that this system helped us prepare for a drought. It's just that the negative shock wasn't quite as large. So the bads weren't quite as bad. It wasn't that it was a, a good system for drought. So we still need to continue with our, our typical drought management plans. I know Red has done some great work in that, so talk to her. And as we decreased density from 10x to 5x, we increased both the revenues, but we also increased our costs. Because again, one of the biggest benefits was labor costs of only having to check one herd. Now we have to go out there and check two herds. So again, some of those labor costs went back up. Um, and then the thing we're going to do next in the next five years of this is really target increased density to certain pastures in certain years. And so we're going to actually tear out a bunch of fence and put more fence in and really separate the loamy from the mixed and sandy pastures and decide, are, is there a benefit to having this rotation in certain pastures in certain years? So do we do it in the loamy pastures um, in, the, in the dry years and do it in the mixed and sandy pastures right in, in the other years and, and see if there's something we can learn from that? One last thing I'll end with before I wrap it up is marketing earlier can be advantageous. So Jenny and I are working on some tools right now. This is some existing work we did. Um, and Jenny and I are going to build on this in the hopefully next couple of months. But if we look at, again, this is Northeast Colorado, but again, looking at three different stocking rates, light, moderate, and heavy. So moderate is NRCS recommended, recommended stocking rates, plus and minus 40% for light and heavy. And we actually have weights every month out there at, at the area station. So look at, the, should we sell them in August, September, or October? If you look at the most profitable on average, which is those blue lines, it's a heavy stocking rate, but we sell them in September, about a month earlier than most people do, because we tend to hit that cyclical peak before everyone brings their calves to market. Um, now, again, if you want to have your highest potential bang for your buck, it's going to be stock heavy and hold them as long as you can, but that's also the biggest potential loss. And so risk management and your risk preference is going to be playing a key, a key role into both your stocking rate and your marketing date decisions. And, and Jenny and I are actually working on a tool right now that we can start to forecast Colorado specific prices by weight for July through October. So as we get into the mid season grazing, you can start to figure out, should I pull some animals off when, and, and what weight should I pull the heavies out this year, pull the lights out if specifically as we get into those drought situations. And so with that, I will maybe have a minute or two for questions. Otherwise there's my email address as well as the, uh, the website for AgNext, which is a relatively new sustainable livestock center here on campus that has, has a lot of engagement expectations. So reach out to us with any and all questions, please. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, John. Yep, we've got two, uh, well, one minute, it looks like, uh, <laughs> before we move on to our next speaker. Uh, we've got one question. Have you guys evaluated the benefits and returns when the animals are rotated more quickly so the feed values don't decrease and pastures are allowed to rest? Yeah, so that is the one caveat. This is not a super fast rotation. Rotations are usually weeks, not days or hours. Um, and so we haven't gone to that super fast rotation of, you know, multiple moves a day or, or moving every day or two. Um, and again, partly that is just logistics out there. And, and could we 
some of these pastures are a couple miles apart and we can't really move them that often, right? Because it just wouldn't work for our system. That would be something that we'd probably want to implement on one of those larger contiguous pastures that we cross fence with electric fencing or maybe virtual fencing to Eric's point, if we can actually make, keep them contained as there's good greener grass only a few steps away. So we haven't done it uh, on that speed yet, but we're hoping to sometime. All right, thank you. And it looks like that's it in the chat for questions. So we'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker. We've got um, Dr. Sean Archibek will be talking about ruminant nutrition. He began his scientific training and education at Colorado State University, where he earned a BS with a double major in environmental health and animal science. He continued his training as a ruminant nutritionist at South, sorry, North Carolina State University, Following his MS, Sean earned a PhD at Texas A&M with Dr. Stephen Smith, an expert in adipose development of livestock species. Sean conducted research with the meat science components of beef cattle production, and it enabled him to apply cellular and enzymatic-based mechanisms for describing nutritional manipulations of beef carcass quality. Thanks, Sean. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, welcome everybody today. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen right now. Hopefully this works out. Uh, let's see. You seeing the slides now? Oh, that's awesome. All right. This is always the, the first test that we have. <clears throat> so before I jump into this, I, I'm doing more of a general talk on cow-calf nutrition, ruminant nutrition. Um, and I'm targeting some areas that we frequently get comments or questions here from producers. Uh, but to give you a brief update on kind of some of the research we've been doing, we've been working with John, Dr. Ritten, and others um, as part of Ag Next. Uh, again, trying to focus on improvement and uh, sustainability of livestock production and one of the big things that we've been looking at are these potential dietary additives that might improve efficiency and productivity of the animals. We've also been doing a lot of work looking at some novel feed ingredients, everything from cannabis byproducts uh, to uh, algae waste, um, all sorts of different things, trying to divert the, those waste streams and turning them into something that's useful and beneficial not only to the livestock producer, but maybe for some of these other tangential um, industries that we work with. And so when we get to the end, if you have any questions about that type of work as well, I'll be happy to answer anything there. So the big things I wanted to do here was just kind of go through some main things that we need to focus on when we're talking about uh, ruminant nutrition, especially cow-calf nutrition. And one of the first things I wanted to point out is just how expensive it is for animals and humans to eat. And so USDA does a survey and they put out some numbers that if you were to prepare as humans, all your home, at home, all your food was prepared to meet the basic nutritional needs of um, most humans, 19 to 50, if you were thrifty, um, we're costing anywhere from $7.63 a day to $9.50 a day. That'd be a pretty heavy rice and lentil type of diet, maybe not the most exciting, but that's about as cheap as you could feed a human and actually meet their, their dietary needs. Whereas as we look at what it costs to feed a, a cow, I'm sure most of you are aware that it's not going to be anywhere nearly as expensive. And so as we look from 2006 to last year, the cost per head per day is somewhat ranged anywhere from $1.10 to $3 per head per day. Um, and we've seen that price continue to increase um, over time. And it tends to sometimes go in big jumps. You might see big jumps in this uh, any given year. And this becomes very important when we start talking about um, effective and profitable beef cattle production, because this is obviously gonna be the number one cost of any of those operations is providing that feed for those animals. So when it comes to feeding the cows, the main thing that we're gonna talk about today 
all you have to remember is that it's all about the bugs. It's all about those different microbes, whether they're bacteria or protozoa or fungi that are inside of the rumen and how those allow us to make use of certain opportunities that other industries and other animals are not going to be able to use. And so if we take care of those bugs, they tend to take care of our animals. And so as we look within the rumen, most of the energy that those animals are actually getting are not coming from glucose, they're not coming from um, fat or anything like that. Most of the energy that our cows are functioning on are these volatile fatty acids that are a byproduct of that anaerobic fermentation. And we'll see that anywhere up to, on our normal situation, about 50% of the protein meat needs are actually the bug protein. They're those little microbes as the cow is essentially digesting them, that's meeting their needs. And this is a good thing because that bug protein is almost exactly what the animal needs. If we look at the profile of amino acids, we can start with something that is very dissimilar to what our animals might need. Um, things like urea that have no true amino acids. And what, what's gonna happen is those bugs will take those nitrogen sources and turn it into amino acids that the animal can use. And it turns them into the amino acids almost in the perfect balance of what they actually need. So, before we get into any specifics, I did want to hit on um, one basic training method, and that is body condition scoring. And so up there, I put a QR code. So if you want to screenshot that or grab that, um, by all means, use that. It's a infographic that I got from the Noble Organization going over body condition scoring in cattle. And you may have been doing this for five years, you may have been doing this for 60 years. Regardless of how much or how often you body condition score cows, I would recommend that you take time at least once a year to go back and go over body condition scoring. I can't emphasize how important this is uh, because um, I'm sure most of you have heard a talk from uh, Dr. Grandin at some time. And one of the, com the terms that she uses is we have to be careful about bad becoming normal. And the, where that, this becomes relevant in body condition scoring is sometimes we can get a bit of a information fatigue when we always see animals that look a certain way. And so if you're in a drought area, you're in a area that maybe has sparser pasture availability and your your cows are thin, your neighbor's cows are thin, all the animals around your area are thin, then thin becomes normal. And over time, you start to slide off of that body condition scoring system and you may score an animal that should be a body condition score of a three and a half or a four as a five, because that's all you ever see. So it's good um, to always go back to that body condition scoring system. Um, I, I can tell you that I myself, every um, January, I try and take it about 30 minutes um, to just kind of go over and review that uh, myself, just because it's good to reground yourself, recalibrate the system, because this is going to be the main mechanism where we're going to be monitoring the nutritional status of our animals out there. And so it's always useful to do that. So I'll get off the soapbox and we'll go back to some important things. Um, so we'll start with energy. And, and actually, before we get into energy, the one thing that I always recommend to my students is before we start worrying about um, rotational systems or grazing systems or what we're going to supplement or are we getting enough energy or protein or any of those things, before we even start any of that, we've got to first make sure that those animals have adequate water. They don't have good, fresh, clean water in adequate amounts. That's gonna limit everything else we might wanna do. So always make sure that you have a good water delivery system and that that water is um, clean and, and plentiful. And part of what that means is having access for all of your animals, it, that you don't limit 
how many animals can be getting a drink at any given time. This can be, become really important as we start talking about different grazing situations where the animals may only visit an area with water a few times a day. And in that situation, we wanna make sure every animal is getting all the water that they need. Now, once that's done, then we're gonna start focusing on energy. And energy is gonna have to be the next big thing we focus on because regardless of how nice of a cow you have, how nice of a program you have, um, that if they don't have energy, they're not going to be productive. Uh, the example uh, that I like to use uh, again here is, yeah, I could have the nicest Lamborghini racing car, but if I didn't have gas, it's just a really expensive paperweight. It's not gonna do a whole lot of good for me, right? So when we're looking at the cow, and we're looking at their base, obviously we want that forage, foraging to be the base of that animal's diet. Um, and obviously use what's available in your given system. If you have access to corn stalks or any aftermath or anything like that, um, definitely use those. We wanna be using um, a lot of the pastures that we have in the Intermountain West. Um, and the reason we wanna use that forage as the base for the cow, number one, it's the cost. Um, there's it's going to be the cheapest way that we can feed that animal. We're going to allow that cow to harvest that food itself. Um, and it's usually pretty safe. Some of the things that we might want to consider, especially as we're looking at maybe trying out different grazing systems, renting lands that we haven't used before, um, is make sure that those animals are not overstocked. We don't want to um, have too much competition. And the, as we're looking at that, if you're using, going to be using any sort of crop aftermath, like uh, uh, corn stalks or wheat stalks or any, any sort of stubble, is at least do a quick run through the field, the pasture, to make sure there's not any leftover grains out in the field, like any great big piles that when people were in a rush during harvest, they spilled out on the ground. If you do see those big piles, just walk over to them and kick them around, kind of spread them out so that one animal can't run up and gobble down all of that and end up making themselves acidotic or something like that. And so in these grazing systems, one of the questions we get asked a lot of time is, does that animal need anything more? Um, and if I was to take one slide out of this entire talk, besides the body condition score, this would probably be the one I would take is we've got to really look at what's happening with nutritional needs throughout that production cycle. And what we'll see is when that cow's dry, early, mid gestation, that's when the requirements are at their lowest. And now as we're getting to the end of uh, gestation, people are going into calving season. Um, this is really kind of the mo one of the most challenging periods. And part of that's because their protein requirements and their energy requirements are increasing during that whole last third of gestation when they're carrying that calf. And they're gonna be at their greatest once they, they give birth and start lactating. And so that's the time when that animal, it, it, just as a, a guide, they need about 10% protein. And if we look at any grazing that's available out there right now, a lot of the pastures we'd be looking at are 7% or even less uh, out there. So they're probably gonna be not only short on protein, but also short on energy. The other thing we've got to consider here is if you have first calf heifers, the one thing to usually consider is trying to house those animals, put them in a different pasture, different pens, whatever your system you're working with, because they're gonna have additional needs. Those uh, first calf heifers, they're still going to need, on top of everything else that your cows are needing, they're going to need additional energy uh, to be meeting their growth needs, as well as the needs for carrying that calf and producing milk for their newborn calf. So there's lots of energy um, sources you can use, everything from your getting uh, high quality forages, um, whether they're hay, silages, whatever that you can get out there that's available in your area. Uh, you can use grains. We'll talk about some of the concerns and things you've got to 
watch out for. Those do add some nice flexibilities, uh, but we do have to be careful how we use those as supplements. And if you, in your area, you have access to buy products, this is where um, things can get really interesting. Everything from distillers grains to wheat mids, gluten feed, anything like that. One of the, those can be really good supplements, not only because they're relatively safe, they're not adding the highly digestible starch like you see with your grains that could cause an acidosis, but you still get a fair amount of energy. You'll also get a decent amount of protein out of those. Now, depending on where you're at in the state, you may be in a different proximity to some of these industries. So if they have, let's, we'll use the ethanol industry as an example. If we look at those industries, the distillers grains are, mo are most available during the summer months. That's when it's easy to have better fermentations. They're gonna have faster turnover. They have more byproduct being produced and following the laws of supply and demand, you tend to have more of that product available. And so prices are at their lowest during the summertime, which unfortunately is when grass is growing and we don't really need a lot of those supplements. Now, if you've got a wet product like that, um, usually if it's delivered at a operation, you have to feed it within five to seven days during the summer months before it goes bad. But one of the things we found um, that works well is um, Dr. Um, John Wagner came up with an idea of making what he lovingly called cow lasagna. And basically what he was doing was taking a roll of low quality uh, wheat straw or any other low quality forage that you've got, basically rolling it out in a pile, driving the truck with some dis wet distiller grains over the top, then some more hay, then some more distiller grains. He just kept making layers and driving his uh, tractor over that, wrapping it with plastic at the end, allowing it to ferment just like you would when you're making silage. And what's going to happen is it's the exact same process as making silage. The pH will decrease, it becomes more acidic, and it's going to preserve that. And so you can buy it at a time when those products are cheap and save them until the winter spring months when you actually need to be feeding them. Um, you can use some fats and oils. We'll talk about some concerns there. And you can use commercial products, whether they're cubes, tubs, liquids, whatever. Um, those are the, always the easy answer, but they're usually the, the least cost efficient. You're paying for the convenience of using those commercial products. And so we'll go through some highlights like that uh, use of distillers grains that might give you some ideas of how you can use byproducts and save them and, and use them to reduce your overall feed costs. So we want that energy to complement the base that we're feeding those animals. And so here I'm just showing you some data on what happens when you start supplementing grain to these animals. And the idea here is once we start getting up around four pounds of corn per head per day, we're gonna see a decrease in hay digestibility as well as the intake. And obviously hay is gonna be our cheap feed. So um, those are all things we don't wanna see. And the reason that that hay digestibility decreases and they're not gonna get as much out of the forage that they might be consuming is that as you start supplementing grain, those bacteria, those bugs are gonna be digesting it. They make more volatile fatty acids. The pH drops down and that you start killing off those bacteria that would normally digest the fiber. Now, with that being said, there are some workarounds, and I'll show you some data here of a study where they were looking at rumen pH. So this is a measure of how much acid is present in that rumen. And the dotted line showing here what happens when you feed those animals a bunch of grain twice a day. And you get this big kind of roller coaster effect where the pH is dropping, and then it comes back up. And in this study, they fed the animals either twice a day or six times a day. Now, I'm not telling anybody to get, run out and start feeding their cows six times a day. I know that's not gonna happen. Um, but what they showed here is that when you have those animals eating the same total amount of grain in a day, if we can get them to eat small meals and just kind of nibble throughout the day on it, they don't have these problems where they decrease room pH and we can get away with supplementing more grain over time. 
So the easy ways to make that happen is through some sort of feed limitation uh, process. The easiest one that I know of is salt. And so if you kind of over salt your grain supplement, um, those animals will they'll eat grain, but then they start getting too much salt and they'll back off. And then they may come back multiple times throughout the day. And by doing that, um, you can get them to start uh, being able to eat more of that grain supplement without uh, decreasing your fiber digestion. So the take homes it, on this is grain is okay as a cow supplement, um, but you want those meals spread throughout the day and definitely no more than three pounds per head per meal. It's kind of a good rule on what you should, can be feeding. Um, as far as fat goes, we've got to remember that Total dietary fat in the ruminant diet can't go very high. We can't get above 5%. Um, otherwise, again, it starts to, de starts to kill off those fiber digesting bacteria, and it can be problematic. The one caveat to this, and again, this is a good idea of why you might want to be separating your first calf heifers from your more mature cows, is that we've seen that in those young developing uh, first calf heifers that they tend to have an improved pregnancy, especially on their second pregnancy, that sophomore slump that everybody talks about, uh, when they are supplemented with about three quarters a pound of fat per head per day. So um, the in general, one of the biggest recommendations we can make is that if you can if you have the pasture space, if you have, the facilities to do that is to make sure that you're feeding your young cows and your more mature cows separately. I know not everybody has the ability to do that, but this is one reason that that we might want to do that. So where we can supplement those young cows, get that improvement in pregnancy. Whereas if we were doing that with our more mature cows, if we didn't have impacts on fiber digestion, the trade-off is that we might be overfeeding those more mature cows. We might be getting them a slightly obese. And that's essentially just, again, a waste of money. Um, and if they're co-mingled at the same time, the other thing that's likely to happen is the more mature cows are going to bully those younger cows and they're going to get the supplementation anyways. And you kind of miss your entire goal there as well. So now we'll start talking a little bit about protein and some things we got to consider when we talk about protein in these animals. And it's important to note that not all proteins the same. We're going to be concerned with degradable intake protein and undegradable intake protein and the impacts that these have on digestion inside of that rumen and helping those animals out. And so the way you can think about this is it, there's so much, only so much protein in a feed, and some of it's going to be digested inside of the rumen by those bugs. And those bugs will take that protein and start to turn it into their own tissues or, or their own cells. And some of it is just going to pass directly through the rumen. It's not going to be degraded at all. That doesn't mean it's not going to be used by the animal. It's just not being digested inside of the rumen. And so when you hear people talking about degradable intake protein, undegradable intake protein, this is what they're talking about. It's not necessarily how much is being digested in total, it's what's being broken down inside of that rumen. So coming out of the rumen, you're gonna ha obviously have that undegradable protein, it's gonna make it down to the small intestine. Any of the bugs that pass on through, they're gonna be digested as well and that's going to end up producing most of the protein that the animal ends up getting. And this is a good thing because, as I mentioned before, the protein that's coming from those microbes as they're being digested, that's almost exactly what the animal needs, right? Um, if we look at the bugs themselves, kind of what they're made up of, they're mostly protein. So that's a, one of the big things that they're getting about that. And the reason we care about this DIP UIP thing that I talked about there is this wonderful idea. And, and no, I didn't suddenly forget how to do math. Um, 
is where we kind of have a two plus two equals five kind of scenario. And so when you're grazing low quality protein forages, so anything less than 7%, and you add a protein supplement, especially a protein supplement that has DIP or that degradable intake protein. So things that you're gonna wanna look for on the label is anything with an ammonia, uh, urea, something of that nature that's gonna be highly digestible inside of the rumen. When we supplement that, not only does the animal get the protein that the bacteria can make from that nitrogen source, we also see an improvement in forage digestion. And so our animals are gonna start getting, um, are, are gonna be getting more and more energy out of every bite of feed that they're consuming out there on the pasture. And all of that's gonna help them to be more productive um, you're going to get more bang for your buck out of that. And that right there is the secret sauce of all, almost all of those range supplements that's out there, is that they have some sort of molasses or some sort of carrier mechanism that has some sugar so the animals will want to eat it. They'll have uh, maybe some vitamin mineral supplement, and they'll have that small amount of urea or other degradable intake protein that really helps them to get more out of the forage that they're consuming. And that's the big secret. Everything else past that, typically more of a smoke and mirrors kind of scenario that we've got to watch out for. So what's happening here is when that animal is kind of eating that low quality hay, they're not getting enough nitrogen. And so in the example I got here, I've got sad bacteria. They're not getting what they need. They're not going to thrive they're not gonna do as good of a job because they don't have the resources they need. So when I start adding some of that degradable intake protein, those bacteria are gonna be doing a much better job. They're happy bacteria now. They're gonna start digesting more and more of that fiber. They're gonna get more benefit out of that. So rather than just taking my word for that, I figured I'd throw some actual data at you to show the impact here. And this was a study done by Joel Caton. This is not a new concept. Um, back in 1988, they did this study, and they had some young growing heifers, and when they or steers, sorry, that they were feeding either a just base uh, forage ration, or they added a small amount of urea. So there's no energy, no true amino acids, just urea that they were adding to those animals' diet. And what you saw was their dry matter intake increased 25%, went from 9.3 pounds a day to 11.6 pounds per day that they were eating. They were digest, and the reason they were able to do that is those bacteria function better. They were able to digest the feed at a faster rate. It wasn't staying inside of the rumen as long, and they're able to get more, for lack of a better term, groceries into the system so that they could then be able to perform at a higher level and be more productive. So pr good protein so supplements to consider out there. Um, any of your high quality forages, alfalfa, Sudan, millet, whatever you have available um, in your particular market. And I really like using those in the grazing system because those are fairly safe. And like we mentioned before, especially at this time of the year as those animals are in the end of their pregnancy. They're starting to go into a calving season. Um, they're starting lactation. That's when nutrient needs are at their greatest. So they're probably going to need some energy as well as that protein. And by giving that high quality forage, whether it's an alfalfa hay, Sudan hay on top of that, they're going to be able to get some extra energy and they're going to digest more of the fiber that they are consuming. And it's going to help them out overall. You'll see a lot of range supplements are using these uh, grain byproducts. Again, a really nice thing to have out there, whether it's distiller's grains, corn gluten feed, any of your types of meals are good uh, protein supplements that you probably won't get quite as much of that uh, bang for your buck, the improvement in fiber digestion with some of these because they tend to have a higher passage rate. You tend to have less degradable intake protein in them. Um, you can use the commercial products, whether cubes, tubs, liquids. Um, those are nice. You'll get 
good quality, good um, quality uh, gradable intake protein. The downside again here is that you're usually uh, probably leaving money on the table by um, overspending on these for what you're getting out of them. And then obviously you can use some urea, but you have to be careful when you're adding urea or mixing it at home because you can um, overdo that sometimes. And so one of the things we've got to make sure is that we don't over um, supplement any of the urea to these animals. All right, so uh, one of the questions I'm seeing here is have we seen too much uh, urea tox toxicity with overcompensation to try and correct low quality feeds? You can run into problems with that sometimes where uh, the animal, especially if the animal is over consuming or it's been poorly mixed. Uh, but usually what I would do is just try and make sure that we've got that mix at a much uh, lower concentrations. The other question we have here in the chat right now is, are there any probiotics that we'd recommend to improve the microbiome at the rumen? Um, right now, I would not recommend any of those out there. Um, outside of just good basics of nutrition, they tend to do better that way. Uh, one of the things that we've seen is there's a lot of different supplements and available products out there. Um, and as we look at the data that we have available right now, it seems that for the most part, uh, it's almost like a coin flip when you look at the data as to whether those animals respond to prebiotics, probiotics. The one caveat to that is our high stress animals. So especially maybe if you're gonna see an impact with probiotics, on any of this type of stuff. It's usually around um, with like say a weaning event, a transportation event, um, parturition, there's not as much data available, but I would probably lump that in as well. But usually if you're in a good managed situation, um, in my opinion, there's not enough data to support feeding a probiotic out there at this time, or at least they haven't developed one that I've seen good data on yet. So we'll keep going through this real quick. So um, obviously when we're using urea as that brood cow supplement, um, if you overdo it, like we mentioned, you can have those toxicity events. Again, the big thing here is make sure that the animal is getting small amounts throughout the day. And usually the toxicity events are when animals are over consuming too much in a, 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 any given meal. And so the way to get around that is again, the salt trick works pretty well. The other thing that you can do, especially if you're making a custom mix is phosphorus uh, tends to limit intake as well. And we're gonna talk about why you want, might wanna do that as well um, in just a second. So those are big things to consider as you're putting together your supplements for those animals. And so we'll go through just a few of the minerals here and things you might wanna consider. So we'll start off with calcium. And if we look at pastures out there, what I've done on this slide is show what the requirements are during both gestation and lactation. And what we'll see is most of the time, calcium's probably adequate or marginal in most of the pastures that our animals might be um, out there grazing. As those animals go into gestation or lactation, again, they might start being deficient in the amounts of, of, the, of calcium in the forages. Uh, once it starts growing, that probably less so, but usually we'll just add calcium anyways. There's a couple reasons for it. It's not that they're trying to um, sell you sand or anything like that. Um, the reason that they're going to add calcium to most of the mineral supplements out there is it's a cheap carrier. Uh, limestone is by far one of the cheapest feed ingredients we've got out there. And uh, it's kind of one of those, let's just be safe and have some uh, insurance make sure we have adequate amounts of calcium present for those animals. 
Um, and phosphorus can limit uh, supplement intake, but calcium usually will not. And the other thing that this does is it's gonna keep your calcium phosphorus ratio in line. And this becomes particularly important um, as we're talking about if you have any male cattle out there. So if you're running any steers, um, whether they're in a back backgrounding situation or developing bulls, it's something that we have to keep in mind is making sure not just that they have enough calcium or enough phosphorus, but that the ratio of those two is optimal. And so usually what I would say is we want that calcium phosphorus ratio somewhere above one to one. I like to just go with twice as much calcium as phosphorus in my supplements. Um, if you do that, usually um, you don't have to, uh, nearly as many problems with the, uh, whether it's urinary calculi or other issues that can develop. So now we'll spend a little bit of time talking about phosphorus. And phosphorus uh, is something that we have to be really aware of, that most of our pastures, most of the year, are going to be deficient in phosphorus, especially in the arid west. Um, this is a very common theme that we see. And one of the things to keep in mind is that as cattle production moved west, one of the first things that producers noticed was a sudden and dramatic drop in fertility in their herds. And this was just seen as one of those things that you just kind of had to accept. And I will, I will tell you that this is probably one of the most common things that I see or that I'm called about here at, at, on campus is that a producer has very poor reproduction rates and we start having a discussion and then we get to the point of the discussion where they say, I don't give any supplement to my animals. Uh, they can just tough it out there. I'm not going to waste money on that. And this is by far one of the things that is going to have an impact. We're not 100% sure as far as to why this is working or how it's working. We just know that it does work. And what happens is when we are looking at um, reproduction rates without adequate phosphorus, it's not uncommon uh, to sometimes see herds with reproduction rates, calf crops down in the 20 to 25% range. And the first study that looked at this was done at the King Ranch down in Texas. Um, and they were, it, they didn't have any commercial products at the time. And so they would just run animals in once a week they were tablespooning Coca-Cola syrup that had lots of phosphoric acid in their mouth. And what they saw in that first study was just by once a week supplementing those animals and getting them up, they almost doubled the, or they did, had an improvement a little bit over twice what the previous reproduction rates were. So it definitely has a pretty big impact. Uh, most of our forages tend to be low in, or high in calcium, low in phosphorus. So the big things to take away from this is we want to make sure we're supplementing all the phosphorus that they need and then add it, enough calcium to make sure we keep that calcium to phosphorus ratio in line. Um, the other thing to consider is if you're going to be using grain as your energy supplement, that grain tends to bring a lot of phosphorus along with it. Um, in addition, most of our those um, industry byproducts, so distillers grains, corn gluten feed, anything like that will tend to have a high phosphorus content as well that those animals can use. And so that they, um, if you're using those as your energy or protein supplements, um, they, can, they can be a good way to also be adding plenty of phosphorus in your system as well. So uh, if I was to try and make a simpler, easier, type of product that meets a lot, checks off a lot of these boxes, it would probably be something that has some distiller's grains that's going to be not digested quite as quick. It has plenty of phosphorus. It's going to have a decent amount of um, energy in it and protein. Um, and it's going to be a good carrot, probably have some calcium added on that. And maybe a little bit of additional urea as well. 
And so that brings up one of the questions I wanted to bring up again is when we're looking at supplements and how we supplement these animals, how you do that's as important as what you are supplementing. And so when we're got these animals, we don't want them to be hyper competitive for accessing the supplement. You don't want animals to be able to bully other animals away from the supplement. So obviously one way you can do that is by having more feed monk space, more supplement space, or spreading it out over a larger area, or just having multiple locations where you're providing supplement that are physically spaced away so that you can't have that one animal that's just bullying the smaller animals out of that supplement, right? So I've got a little bit of time, so I'm gonna hit a couple other topics. Again, we're hitting springtime. It's something that we've got to be aware of as that grass starts to grow. Um, we've got to watch out for grass tetany as well. And this is usually going to end up in a low magnesium blood concentration. And what will happen is the cows go down. And with this grass tetany, you tend to see a more rigid tetany. The muscles are going to be bunched up. They're very contracted. Um, and what's happening is as that grass is growing very rapidly, we have potassium and potentially nitrogen competing with magnesium, and that's what's causing the problem. And so the simple work around this is that um, we're going to see <coughs> more high magnesium supplements available in the spring. That's what you're going to want to do especially with this group that I'm talking to, I know that you are not unfamiliar with drought. And so when, as we get droughts, particularly in Colorado, we can end up with some unique situations. So if we go back a little over 10 years ago, we had a couple of years where we had some really dry springs, dry summers. Um, I remember being in Cortez and seeing um, essentially no grass out in the pastures. It looked like just big dirt fields. And then suddenly in August, it started to rain. And we got a lot of rain in August. And it hadn't, grass had really hadn't grown all year long. Well, then we ended up with this sudden, rapid, lush growing grass in August. And none of the feed mills or any of the feed uh, options had a lot of high magnesium supplements available at that time. So it's important to know that even though we usually think of this as a spring issue, if you have an event like a drought followed by a, a sudden rainstorm later in the season, that can push the season where you have to be concerned about grass tetany to a much later time. So I'm gonna skip past that um, and uh, kind of come down back here to vitamins. So as far as our trace minerals, most of the um, forages that are out there are going to be deficient in trace minerals. Um, so we usually want to have year-round supplementation of those. As far as vitamins go, just to kind of round this out and then I'll open up for questions at the end, is that uh, when, during gestation and lactation, the needs are going to increase again, but it's important to know that all the vitamin K, all of the B vitamins are made by the microorganisms. The bugs themselves are gonna take care of that. So the big things that we've got to worry about are vitamins A, D, and E, and making sure we have adequate amounts of them. I put what's up there. Um, vitamin D, during the summer, the animal's gonna make pretty much all that they need on their own regardless of what their hide color is or anything like that. Um, so when they're on su fresh summer, any sort of growing forage that's not dormant, they probably don't need any sort of vitamin supplement. The caveat to that is gonna be if you're in like the Pacific Northwest or um, yeah, animals are housed indoors or weird things like that, but during the winter time, especially um, after September until April in Colorado, um, 
they probably would benefit from a supplement that includes vitamins A, D, and E. Uh, the other thing that we've got to think about is when we're around this calving season that we're moving into right now, we've seen that uh, if the animals are in low vitamin E status, they're not being supplemented with vitamin E, there tends to be an increase in retained placentas and then the secondary infections and metritis that might come along with that. And there's a growing body of evidence that shows if we start hyper supplementing vitamin E right around the calving period, uh, we tend to have a pretty dramatic decrease in these retained placentas, um, metritis, and even some mastitis and other tangential uh, uh, diseases that might come along with those. So our recommendation would be if it's av available, probably add some additional vitamin E in the diet around the calving season. The other nice thing about vitamin E is I don't have to worry as much about those toxicity issues. Uh, because as, as of right now, there's no described vitamin E toxicities out in the, the literature. So the walk away here is if you got green and growing plants, you probably got decent levels on your vitamins. You don't need to supplement. Um, and to me, I, especially when we're on mature or dormant pastures, it's just a cheap insurance versus dealing with any sort of deficiency there. So with that, I'll stop sharing my thing, hopefully. And open up the for questions. Thank you, Sean. Well, I think we, I think you were able to answer the two questions that we had in the chat already. And I don't see any new ones. So I think that might wrap up your portion. Appreciate it. Okay. Oh, wait, there's one right there. Best forages to add to our pastures, recommendations. Um, I would probably defer more to the, the rain scientists on this one, but the, the big thing with uh, forages to, to add in there is having a good mixture out there, obviously adding some uh, legumes out there in your pastures is always a good thing. Any sort of improved pasture that's gonna have a, a better mix of protein and, and diversity out there works pretty well. Um, and in my experience, especially on the Western slope, some of the times we get in the habit of, we have an improved pasture and the next thing you know, it's been 15 years since anything's been done out there. And so staying up on top of that, making sure you have a, a good mixture of, of different forages out there. All right. Well, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. Up next, we've got Reagan Adams. She's going to discuss the um, um, over-the-counter antibiotics and the high path avian influenza and a little bit about Reagan. She graduated from the University of Florida College of Vet Medicine after stints as an equine veterinarian in Florida, Maryland, and Louisiana. She moved to Colorado where she has held various positions at CSU College of Vet Medicine and Biological Sciences. In 2009, she joined the CSU Vet Extension Specialist Team. In this position, she became involved in many extension teams where expertise in health and welfare of animals was needed but had not been previously available. Community animal disaster planning has been a major interest and she is a CSU delegate to the Extension Disaster Educational Network, recently serving as the vice chair of the Ag and Natural Resources Committee. The importance of biosecurity to prevent animal and zoonotic infectious disease is another area of commitment, and she works with underserved and small-scale producers, as well as part of the CSU CERES advisory team. All right, thanks, Reagan. Hey, hi, everybody. How are you? 
Um, actually, okay, let me see if we can get this screen up because I've been attacked by a poltergeist mostly today. Um, are we seeing that, Megan, or not? Megan, are we seeing anything? No. Okay. okay. Um, there we go. We are. Okay, what do you know? We might be doing better then. Great. I've had a, I've been on two other Zooms and already had uh, it didn't work twice. So we're just lucky. Um, you guys, I am most honored to be what I call the um, cleanup pitcher, or the cleanup player on this team of gr this roster of great speakers today. Now, most of you guys that most of you all that know that um, phrase from baseball would expect me to be a great hitter. And I'm not really a great hitter being the cleanup position, but I am going to talk about two highly visible issues that I want to make sure your answers are. Um, that we've answered your questions about that. So that's over-the-counter medically important animal antibiotics removal, and then much talked about HPAI or bird flu outbreak. So what we are doing is, let me see. Come on, everybody, let's go. Why am I not going? There we go. So first of all, I'm just, this is the facts and the details about what you need to know about the removal of uh, medically important animal antibiotics from the um, over-the-counter sales. First of all, the antibiotics, it's going to be antibiotics that are going to be removed, and it's the ones that are met, considered medically important because they're given to animals and to people. And the, they are trying, it's going to be necessary to have a veterinary prescription to get those antibiotics. This is effective as of June 11th, 2023. So you got about three months to get ready for it. The people in charge of doing this is the Center of Veterinary Medicine, part of the Food and Drug Administration. And they're the ones that have the oversight of the safety of antibiotics and other things you give your animals and, and drugs that, get, that people get. And they are also, um, they oversee what happens to them once they hit the market and they have the ability to take them off the market or put into prescription necessity. Why is this happening? It's to decrease the development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. Many of you may not know, I'm one of those people who didn't know, that 10 years after they first put on the first penicillin, they first discovered the first penicillin um, drug that was so wonderfully successful, bacteria started to become resistant to it. So if the bacteria are exposed to antibiotics, especially if you have too low a dose or not a long a time regimen, they will develop um, resistance to that antibiotic and then that drug is gone. What's a big problem about that is initially when we we're developing antibiotics, there were 12 different companies that were hotly in the business. Now there are four in the business because it's harder to develop antibiotics, it's more costly. And so as we, if we lose antibiotics that are, because the bacteria become resistant, we don't have as many players in the game making new ones for us. And that goes for humans and, and animals. So what's this, oh, sorry, sorry. Didn't mean to jump the gun. So what do you need to do? This applies to both livestock owners and pet owners. So that what you have to do is develop a veterinary client patient relationship with a DVM. In the livestock world, that means a veterinarian who has come to um, who has come to your farm or your ranch, sees what kind of operations you have, what kind of risks you have. You talk to them about where you get your animals, how you feed them, you know, whether they mix with other animals at the BNBL, BLM land or whether they're a closed herd. So they understand what the risks and possibilities of kind of diseases that you might get. They don't have to be the one to diagnose the need for it at, at the moment when you have that need, they also don't have to give the antibiotic, but you have to have a relationship with them so that they can write the prescri prescription so you can get that um, antibiotic. And I've had past questions where people have asked me, does this apply to vaccinations or dewormers? It doesn't. It's medically important animal antibiotics that are used to treat people and animals. 
So with that, if you want to hear me talk about it for about an hour, you can go to this um, link at the bottom of the slide and hear a recording of something that I did for the Pueblo County Extension. Otherwise, does anybody have any questions about that issue right now? If so, you can pop on the chat or... Yeah, we don't have any in the chat just yet. Well, I know a lot of people grumble about it. I just want to make sure that um, they have the opportunity to ask questions about it. So while you're thinking about that, let me just re repeat about the veterinary client patient relationship. This every state has a slightly different wording for their VCPR. The one you have right here is has to do with Colorado, the way Colorado um, explains its VCPR. And as you read this, you'll recognize that it's a bit vague. And as many regulations that are start out vague, that can be good and can be bad. Um, what's important for you to understand is that you don't necessarily need it written down on a piece of paper. It's a, a relationship you develop with your veterinarian um, between you two. And I'm sure that it, you know, the, the definition could dis, could get more precise in, in the future, or it could stay like this, because remember that it applies not only to pets, but to livestock operations. And so the way a veterinarian works with um, clients in those two situations can be vastly different. But this is the way it, it's listed, and this is what we're working with. And I am sure things will, you know, things will change to hopefully make it work better in the future. Megan, we get in, I got C3 chats. Are there any questions associated with those? Let me see. I'm ready. No, Retta was just um, chatting in a link to your YouTube. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah. Okay, well then that's great. Then that means we got an audience that understands it because a lot of people don't. So that's wonderful. Next topic. Come on, next topic. Why are we not going? This is the kind of thing that happens to me these days. That's, um, my screen's frozen here. Come on, babies. Huh. Anybody able to move this on? It doesn't seem to want to go. Ah. Uh. Megan, um, I could share my screen if you want. Um, well, let me see what happens if I pop it here. Yeah, I just this computer's just giving me problems these days, but it's overworked, I think. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about bird flu or avian um, high path avian influenza. This is uh, data from the USDA APHIS uh, um, website as of March 1st. I believe that was yesterday. I put this out here so they appreciate that this is the worst poultry health problem the United States has ever seen. It also could be called the worst animal health pro, um, problem that we've ever seen in the United States. So a lot, I think a lot of times if you haven't been affected by it, if it isn't in your county, if it isn't in your region, you go, really, how big a deal is this? Until you go to buy eggs in the grocery store right before Christmas. And then everybody goes, $9 for an 18, you know, for 18 eggs, this is high, highway robbery. robbery. Well, the, it is because we're in the largest um, public uh, poultry health problem uh, disease in that the United States has ever seen. Um, at this time, at this time, uh, this is data from last February when we got our first case in a domestic um, flock in the United States, all the way up to uh, this Tuesday. Uh, 770 confirmed flocks, 47 states affected, um, mostly the commercial flocks, as you know, are large. The backyard flocks more are affected, but they're smarter. For almost 60 million birds affected. Um, the, it is still considered a foreign animal disease. So they are trying to not allow it to become endemic, which means that it's just here. Because if we did let that happen, our trade in the poultry business would um, go, go to hell, as they say, just go to hell. Um, so we don't want, we want to uh, wipe this out. We are on the verge again of a new, migra of a new migration. The Eastern state flocks are beginning to, um, 
come down with it again. We had a flock just last week in um, Colorado that was a backyard flock that um, had to be um, that died, so it didn't really have to be depopulated, but had to tre be treated as an identified flock. So it's beginning again, and it's something we need to pay attention to. Oh, man. That's just being so funky. Um, to look at these, uh, how widespread it is in a different way, this is a picture from the end of uh, December of all the states that have had the bird flu. And you can see in the darker colors in Colorado that um, that means that we were actually the third most affected state in the country. One wonders why um, there's going to be researchers looking into the distribution of this disease in, in the United States for years to come. Right now, we think that that most likely happened because the Central Flyway, which Colorado is right in the middle, has a lot of birds and birds like to stop in Colorado. This year, the um, outbreak has been carried primarily by wild birds, waterfowl mixing with our um, domestic poultry. And so, and when that, when I mean that mixes, it doesn't just mix, it's not because some goose gets into your um, poultry coop, but it does mean that a, a mouse or a crow could be infected and then go into your, poult into your poultry coop and then affect your backyard chickens. So similarly, now, nowadays, I think, most of the state is used to seeing an awful lot of um, wild geese around. And when they poop and their feathers fly around, just even golf courses and parks in the city, et cetera, people walk through them, then walk in and to their own backyard, take care of their um, chickens and actually um, expose their, their chickens to the um, virus. So it's highly infectious. And um, if when birds, even one bird gets in a flock, no matter the size of the flock, very apt to have 99% of that flock die. So we want to get it out of the country. As I said before, we've had, or as I was wanted to say, we were the third most affected state. It occurred in 10 counties across the state, 22 um, domestic, I mean, 22 uh, premises were affected, eight being commercial with more than 6 million birds being affected, and 14 backyards with more than 1,000 birds being affected. So it's a, it may not have happened in your county, but it's a big deal. The Colorado Department of Ag Resources has a wonderful website, which they keep up to date. And in fact, every Friday, they publish a weekly situational report so you can know where it is, what stage stage of response is occurring there and when uh, those areas will be clean. They've been doing this for 37 weeks. Uh, one of the things I wanna um, emphasize is that Dr. Maggie Baldwin, our state veterinarian, is having a webinar for, um, for free on March 15th at five o'clock where you, if you can, you can register at this um, link and submit questions you want to ask her about the disease. So please, uh, it's going to be, we hope it's going to be very well attended and we hope that um, you will join us. Now tell me who has questions about avian flu, anyone? I don't see any in the chat. Oh, here we go. Can you talk to the issue of other animals eating infected waterfowl? Great question, Travis. Thank you so much for allowing me. As I say, because I didn't know who was going to be um, at this meeting, I wasn't sure who would be that infect that interested in certain parts of it. But that is a very big problem. Initially, coyotes, red foxes, skunks, raccoons, anybody who could forage after a, um, after a dead goose or a weak neurologic goose, which they oftentimes show signs of, uh, we're getting it um, here and there around the state in the United States, mostly because of the fact they were eating it and then getting a very high load, um, load of virus. A little bit more concerning is lately we've seen positives in mountain lions in, and this is just in Colorado alone, but in other uh, other states as well. Um, we've, as I say, not just coyotes, but mountain lions, black bears, um, 
there's somebody else I'm missing. And they, they, don't, they don't just die. They have been necropsied and shown to have the disease. And one of the things we, one of the reasons people are so worried about highly pathogenic avian influenza is it can jump from poultry to mammals and from mammals we're mammal, but to, into the human population. If the um, virus is exposed, if the people are exposed in a high enough concentration of virus. And that's one of the re reasons why, I mean, it's worrisome that the wild mammals are, have it, but we again want to keep people from being exposed to it. So for instance, the people that respond to the HPAI outbreaks are tested heavily for it after they have worked closely with um, the poultry that that are have been affected because we really want to have we call that spillover and we're hoping we we think that this particular version of the virus doesn't isn't highly connected or at this point um, successful at bonding onto human. Uh, respiratory epithelium, that lining of your lungs. So we don't think people are that concerned, are apt to get it, but we certainly don't want them to be exposed much. On the um, CDA uh, webin uh, webinar, I mean, in, in the CDA um, website, they have lots of information from the Colorado Parks and Wildlife and from CDA on what you do when you have dead birds or when you see a dead dead animal in terms of wearing gloves and putting them in bags and things like that to minimize your contamination. And we want to hope that's happened. In other parts of the world, I think Cambodia is one of it. A couple of people have died from HPAI, but we really don't want that to happen. And then the other culprit that we're a little bit worried about are dogs that, and I have one of them, that wander through a park or something where a bunch of um, geese have been. And I mean, this dog just hoovers down a, um, a bird poop. She loves it. So, and thus, if those birds were positive, she has the possibility of exposing herself to that disease. Um, if people have dogs or cats, that are showing signs of respiratory or neurologic disease, they should certainly take them to their veterinarian to, uh, and they can be tested for HPAI. So I hope that um, answers your questions. Do you have any a little bit more particular aspect of it, um, Travis, you'd like to hear about? Not necessarily, Reagan. I, I've just some of the other raptor species and things that have been passed on as well from eating infected waterfowl. They, they certainly have. And a lot of um, people that really aren't that interested in um, poultry have really noticed that. I live in Old Town, uh, Fort Collins, and about a week ago, I saw five eagles, two adults and three um, juveniles fighting over the five or six dead uh, geese on the ice. Um, in the middle of Fort Collins. And it was, it's, and I saw one this morning that the bald eagles are of much interest, the red tailed hawks, the owls, pe the sort of general public is really between the high uh, egg pro prices and the um, waterfowl. And I mean, and those precious birds being affected, uh, the general public's beginning to understand about it. Okie dokes, I see are any affected Santa at anyway. Um, Callie asks us here on the chat about um, effective sanitizers against HPAI for foot baths, things like that. Um, we shouldn't just go for sanitizers. We should go for hardcore beach, uh, bleaches, et cetera. And that there is a wonderful, the USDA APHIS in the Defend the Flock series has a wonderful um, new product called Bring Home the Blue, Not the Flu, which addresses um, the best way to handle HPAI threat if you're having fairs and shows. And that's something for the extension people on the call, I will include that link for you all um, when I send out my weekly notice on avian flu. And then someone else asked me um, about what do you do for a sick or dead bird? As I said sort of briefly, you wear gloves, 
You wear clothes that you can immediately wash. You double bag the um, birds and you put them uh, and you put them in in the trash. They don't have you because you're putting them in a plastic bag. They don't necessarily say you have to burn them or something like that. Um, but you don't want to touch them and you want to wear a mask so you're not breathing. They carry the virus in their in their feathers as well. So you don't want that stuff to, to you don't want to inhale that sort of thing. So that's a great question. And then there was one other one. Um, oh, Gus. Yes, that's great. Um, Gus has, he has concerns that cases may be underreported due to people not wanting to terminate their backyard flocks. Um, first of all, I want to get more uh, let me talk about what, um, the amount of HPAI in wildlife. Certainly, they can't, they do surveillance so that when um, CPW knows there's one bird infected in a county, then likely any amount of birds are, are affected. And they can't, pop, they can't afford with their resources to, um, to test every single one. So yes, Actually, the wild bird population surveys are definitely underreported. Um, I think you're probably absolutely right that some of the uh, backyard people probably aren't uh, reporting their flocks. I will say that in, in part, that's exceedingly sad for them because usually those flocks say there's 10 birds. They'll, the owners will walk out one morning and 10 birds will be dead or nine birds are dead and the next one's dead by you know the afternoon. They die very quickly. The larger backyard facilities, 20, 100 birds, what will happen is eventually the majority, you know, 99% of those birds will die. And while those birds are sick, they will be making lots and lots of more virus and contaminating the area as well. So if those people try to cover that up and then bring back birds without, um, good deep cleaning and decontamination, they will um, lose birds again and again. And in fact, that's something people are asking us about. Is this the year that I get poultry or chicks? Um, I've always wanted to do it. And, and environment, um, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, eggs are so expensive. The trouble with doing that is that they can, um, is they can easily get wrapped up in this um, outbreak. And so we usually tell them, start that hobby another time. So let me think on, I'm running into, can HPI spread uh, through drinking water from a pond? If Yes, it certainly can. In fact, that's uh, Ron Murphy asked that. One of the greatest ways in wh which the wildfowl are contaminating, especially backyard flocks, et cetera, are animals are places where they share drinking water. So you want to make sure that your birds, your domestic birds are not using the same water source that the um, wild birds are. See, Eric asks, thoughts on cattle grazing and drinking in spring wet meadows with lots of waterfowl and grouping. Anything could happen. I mean, we don't, that that's a possibility. So if there's a way to um, distract those waterfowl from um, sharing water with your cattle as well. It would be a good idea. And let me see, representing this one case, it got lost. Oh, um, Retta, I don't quite understand your question. Can you restate that? I was reposting, so I can try, but okay. it, is this one, are other species besides poultry showing the same intense level of morbidity and mortality? Is that the one? Oh, we, certainly. We have had, um, we, we have had, uh, why, um, let me see, what, what are we talking about it? We certainly have had turkeys had problems with it. It's not just chickens. It's any domestic poultry have been affected as well as some game birds. There was a, um, farm of game birds on the western slope that um, they had to be depopulated because they got it as well. Um, when people, if people do decide to start, you know, poultry business um, this spring, they should just be exceedingly careful about disinfecting, about biosecurity, about keeping a closed flock. For people that are moving chickens around, say they have 
um, poultry and they just have to have four more chicks for their kids, be sure. The most important thing to do is make sure that you um, keep those new birds away from your established flock for two to four weeks to make sure they aren't sick or they aren't going to get sick before you mix them with your um, with your home flock. Closed um, flocks are the most important thing. Okay, let me see what else we got here. Um, Repo, what's the risk of human eating hunted birds? Oh, well, actually, um, if you cook the birds well, then poultry does not seem, you know, eating poultry meat does not seem to be a problem or those other things you're eating, but be sure to, to um, not, not to make, uh, not to eat them raw. Um, that would just expose people to getting that. But the, eat, the food safety issues, if you cook them well, is not a problem. Is there any... Um, oh, that's interesting. Is there any concern for contamination from bird droppings? Well, again, people should be um, washing their vegetable and their produce. Um, and so they shouldn't necessarily, you know, they may be exposed to virus that way, but not if they wash them appropriately. Um, our other species, as I said, yes, there have been um, other animal, other species of birds. Crows actually have a high mortality. The owls have, the red-tailed deer, I mean, the red-tailed hawks, um, the eagles have, but it's hard for us to be able to say how many of the wild animals um, are have it because we don't know how many of them died quietly out in nature. If you find a sick or collapse, I, I think, um, did we get still? Oh, is CPW still testing all waterfowl or any kind of bird or fray that they just want to dispose of them uh, yourself? If you have waterfowl or birds of prey that die on your property, I um, you can call your local CPW, tell them, ask them if they have the um, bandwidth to come pick it up. Otherwise, they might ask you to um, uh, dispose of it. Again, when, because of the fact that they do with it, they do surveillance, which means they just want to know if the disease is in the area. They don't have exact numbers of, of animals because it would just be too expensive and it blows out their budget. And it's really not important to know how many animals have it. It's important to know that it's in a particular area. So I think the latest um, case in Colorado was up in Moffat County, which Megan and I are going to talk about after this. And so anybody in that area just should know that yes, you it, it's it's hot and going in that um in that part of town. So incur please encourage um, all your neighbors and friends and colleagues to come to the avian influenza. Um, webinar that Maggie Baldwin's giving she and she wants you to um, bring your questions. You can, um, when you register, you can add your questions to the list so she can make sure that everything's been answered. I'm afraid I've gone over. I'm so sorry. I thought I was, I thought I was going to be good. <laughs> no, I think you're good, Reagan. Um, you might have touched on this one already. I'm not sure. Can HPAI spread through drinking water from a pond? Yes. They can. That's a big way that ant, wild animals and backyard poultry or, and, or free range uh, poultry get um, connected is through drinking water. Okay. Oh, uh, Robin. Well, poultry shows be allowed at this year at County Forest. Thank you very much for asking that, Robin. At this point, the state veterinarian has not shut down any poultry shows because of the fact um, yeah, she, they haven't said it, but if they want to leave that to the local fair boards, whoever's in charge of those, however, that that's what's happening right now. If for some reason there is a giant outbreak across the state, that might change. Or also if the fairground or show would be held in an area which has a quarantine because of the fact there is an outbreak in a poultry facility in that county then the uh, show would have to be canceled. But at this time, it is up to the, um, the people who want to put on the shows. And she encourages and will be talking about the details of that um, at her 
in her webinar on March 15th. But thanks for that question. So it's it's all go now, but it, she's include she's really encouraging you to have good biosecurity uh, processes and realize that it could stop if there was some big outbreak. And I can't tell you how much everybody wants to know if this disease suddenly just goes away or plagues us for another year or two. We have the we have no way of knowing. Um, Ryan, there's a, yeah. a, a kind of a statement slash question here. CDA had that same statement on the 14 day quarantine period in their latest update. However, none of their biosecurity flyers have that indicated in there. Feed stores, chick sellers, lo all local are hesitant to have the flyers out and to potentially decrease their sales. Um, is there a way that you you or Extension can suggest that the CDA include that quarantine statement in their biosecurity flyers? The um, they um, the one I have to check is they just put out one, they just put out a news release yesterday in which I begged them to do that, and I actually don't remember if they did or not, but. Um, if they didn't, Megan, I will um, emphasize that to them and we might get them. It's always better if information comes from the same person. As you know, that's why we've been trying to follow the CDA and the um, USDA's uh, wording. I'll do my best to try to get that on their in their literature. Megan, because, this is Kelly. I'm sorry to interrupt, but they did include the 14-day the quarantine in their press release. It um, did it did which was fantastic just the the real simple one sheeter that kind of walks new people through biosecurity um it do, it's not included in there and i think like when i've been talking to my feed stores here um i just i want that to be in there so they don't feel like i'm trying to not i'm trying to take away their business <laughs> great great no uh, um you know, you think you've done, every, has anybody had that situation where you think you've done everything you can, and then you go, how do I miss the obvious? So we're going to keep plugging away. I got him to explain what commingling meant. So that was a step forward, <laughs> because that's a regulatory word that you use. So I'm so sorry, it's 131. Um, no, you're good. Thank you, Reagan. We appreciate it. Um, and, uh, I do want to, for the people, Megan, for the people that are from extension on this, Maggie's also going to be at the, um, at the 4-H livestock uh, meeting on April 5th, I think it is, to discuss this further, because we really want to get everybody listening to what everybody else is hearing so that we can, you know, get a good response. Okay. Perfect. Sounds great. Thank you. And for everybody on the webinar, we will be sending out um, an evaluation link in the chat and potentially via email as well. But if so, so if you could keep an eye out for that and um, let us know how we did and how we can improve next year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.